Hello, fellow kids, and welcome back to What is Politics? In this episode, I'll be talking about how conflicts that are on the surface about identity groups, particularly when it comes to national identity groups, that these types of national conflicts typically hide conflicts within those identity groups, where the people who claim to speak and act for their national group are often screwing their own people in the name of their own people, propagating lies and myths in order to perpetuate conflict and sabotage cooperation between the different identity groups for their own advantage. And the Israel-Palestine conflict is a really stark example of this, in ways that are rarely explored or understood. And I'm recording this in early 2024, when Israel has been carrying out a non-stop massacre for months, which is an exceptionally atrocious example of this phenomenon. And to me, this horror story is very much the culmination of more than 100 years of manipulation by nationalist elites. And as we'll see next time, this has been going on on both sides from the beginning. And this might be surprising to people who are new to this conflict, especially if your first introduction to it is watching Israel annihilate Gaza and listening to the demented, genocidal ravings of its morally degenerate and absolutely stupid government and military leaders. Or if your first introduction to this conflict was watching Hamas fighters going on their murder-rape-horror movie rampage on October 7th. If these were your introductions to this conflict, it might be surprising for you to learn that the majority of people on both sides of this conflict tend to think that these atrocities are forms of morally justified self-defense. And part of this is just social media bubbles. Like where if you're Arab or Muslim or in or from the third world, you're seeing nonstop mass death and brutality on innocent people and children in Gaza on your social media feeds. And if you're in a Jewish pro-Israel bubble, you're still seeing interviews with freed Israeli hostages and October 7th rescuers about the horror stories that Hamas carried out. And both sides are hearing that the worst atrocities or numbers from their side are just fake news. But beyond social media, the idea that this is self-defense on my side against aggression on your side is the result of two quite coherent, logical, conflicting sets of historical narratives on either side of the conflict, which long predate the existence of social media, and which paint the conflict as a whole as my side engaging in legitimate self-defense against the aggression of your side in a conflict that your side started. It's not like people are thinking, we are superior, we are the colonizers, or we are the terrorists, and we want your land, so we're going to take it. It's, you started this conflict, and we're just defending ourselves from you, and we have the moral higher ground, even as they're committing the worst atrocities imaginable. Like what happened on October 7th, and like what's been happening ever since October 7th. And I'm recording this in February, after tens of thousands have been killed, and more than a million people made homeless, and countless others starving and dying of disease in Gaza. And if you're not in that social media bubble, look it up. If we want to understand what's happening right now, we need to understand these narratives and how they motivate people to carry out and support these atrocities. Like, how did we get from never again, which was the slogan after the Holocaust, to there are no innocent civilians over the age of four, which is something that you're hearing more and more in Israel. But first, in this episode, I'm going to present the basic facts of the conflict that most historians would agree on, regardless of their politics in order to give you guys the basic picture of what's going on so that everyone will be up to speed for the next episode, where I tear the Israeli and Palestinian nationalist narratives into pieces, and I get into some very underexplored and ignored facts, looking at them through the perspectives that we've been talking about on this show from the beginning. Anthropology, class conflict, evolution, materialism, and words. And once we do that, we can begin to unveil a version of the history of this conflict that most of you have probably never heard before. And it places the blame for this conflict where it belongs, on particular individuals and classes of people, and not on the entire amorphous identity groups that these people pretend to represent. And that is what you need if people are ever going to accept the type of compromises that are necessary in order to achieve a just peace. And my presentation will surely disappoint everyone, especially when your blood is boiling because of what's going on right now. Because it's sympathetic to both narratives, and I genuinely am sympathetic to both narratives, even if I know that they're both full of shit in so many ways. And I poke a little bit at each of them, but I don't really challenge either of them in any fundamental ways. Think of it as like a 101 university course, where the teacher just sort of soft pedals everything because he doesn't want to get cancelled 
or get in trouble with the administration, which will be for next time, after the teacher gets divorced and has a midlife crisis and goes on a rampage. But first, I'm recording this little intro after having finished the episode, because I'm finishing this as this insane massacre is currently happening, and has been going on for more than 140 days now. And this massacre is something which can be stopped, particularly by pressure from people inside of the United States, whose military funding makes this horror story possible. You can help stop this. And I want to point out that this massacre happening in Gaza is not only morally monstrous, but it's also just completely and utterly unnecessary. Even if you believe that the Arabs started the entire conflict and everything is their fault, and even if you believe that every Arab in Gaza is a 1980s cartoon character that just wants to murder all of the Israelis and the only thing stopping them from doing that is force, even if you believe that, there is still no reason to support this slaughter. And it is completely insane for you to do that and against your own self-interest. People on the Israeli side ask me over and over again, what else are we supposed to do? How else can we prevent October 7th from happening again and again? Well, let me tell you what you can do. And it's not complicated at all if you just think about it for two minutes. Number one, when Qatar and Egypt were going to stop funding Hamas in 2020, Netanyahu, the Prime Minister of Israel, begged them to continue because he wanted to keep the Palestinians divided. If not for that, Hamas wouldn't have been able to carry out October 7th. So number one is stop fucking funding Hamas. And number two, when October 7th happened, it took the Israeli army eight hours to respond, which is unbelievable. You can literally walk across Israel at a leisurely pace from east to west in some parts in three hours. So why did it take so long? Where were all the troops who were supposed to be stationed at the border with a hostile enemy where supposedly every child over the age of four is a threat to Israel, well, in a large part, it was because the army had moved its soldiers away from the Gaza border and into the West Bank to support these maniacal price tag revenge gangs, where Jewish settlers burn homes and beat up old men as collective punishment for various attacks by Palestinians. If not for that, then the Israeli army could have stopped the Hamas fighters before they even crossed the fence, and Israeli generals have even said as much. So, number two is have the army do its fucking job instead of helping psychotic maniacs do pogroms in the West Bank. And number three, Israeli intelligence agents were warning about this attack for months and begging their superiors to pay attention to it. Yet they didn't. And I don't know if it's because they're just complete arrogant imbeciles, which they are, and they just wouldn't take the young women intelligence agents seriously, or if it's because they let it happen on purpose as an excuse to depopulate Gaza, which the right wing have been dreaming of for decades now. But either way, all you have to do to stop more October 7th is stop funding Hamas, stop using the military to help revenge gangs, and if you insist on keeping up the blockade on Gaza forever, then expect more attempts to attack Israel, and then listen to your fucking intelligence agents when they tell you that a big one is about to happen soon. There is zero reason for this slaughter, except to keep Israelis enraged and afraid so that Netanyahu and his bloodthirsty gang of gremlins in his cabinet can stay in power for just a little bit longer, and so that Netanyahu stays out of jail just a little bit longer on all his corruption charges. I understand that your blood is boiling, and I'm somebody who believes in revenge, but whoever supports this monstrous massacre should be ashamed of themselves ashamed of supporting this completely unnecessary mass death of innocent people, and ashamed for letting the disgusting, stupid little monsters in power rob you of your humanity. And this isn't even to mention the political solutions to this conflict, which we can start to talk about once we understand the basic history, and the narratives of how this conflict started, and why it never ends, and why it's going to require a massive de-brainwashing campaign in order for peace ever to occur. And now, on to the episode that I spent the last four and a half months working on. Hello, fellow kids, and hopefully a few adults. Welcome back to What is Politics, where we try to make sense of the political nonsense that we learn in media and academia so that we can become more empowered and effective political actors. <laughs> 
Today, we're going to solve the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, or rather, we're going to make sense of it from a very different angle to how people normally look at it, which in my opinion, at least, makes a solution to the conflict much more conceivable than it has been for a long time, or even ever. And in order to do that, we need to do two things. First, in any conflict, there are conflicting versions of history, conflicting sets of facts or stories put together from the same facts. And these stories, or narratives as political theorists and historians like to call them, usually include a lot of myths and fake news, which justify the objectives and actions of the various actors on different sides of the conflict. And this is just as true in a messy divorce as it is in an international or intercommunal conflict like the Israel-Palestine conflict. So first we need to get a general grasp of what the conflicting versions of history are so that we can understand the behavior and psychology of the different actors on the different sides of the conflict. And then, we want to see if we can compare these versions of history with the actual facts. And there's actually more consensus on the facts than people realize about these sorts of things among professional historians, even historians who have different political points of view, versus in popular folk versions of history that float around in the public imagination and which are much more based on myths and fake stories which had been debunked by historians decades ago. And where we compare the facts to the historical narratives, and we find important fabrications or important omissions from those narratives, we want to look at who's been in charge of disseminating these false stories, and to what end, for what purpose. Because unlike a divorce, where there are just two people fighting it out, each seeking to advance their own interests, whether it's material or financial or psychological and emotional, in intercommunal conflicts, you usually have various classes of people. And the people who have the power to disseminate information to other members of a society are very often manipulating the general public for their own ends. And this is a huge aspect of the Israel-Palestine conflict. In my opinion, if not for misrepresentation of facts by leaders, this entire conflict might have been resolved a long time ago. And we'll talk about all of this in depth later. But first, one important aspect of knowing the different historical narratives is to understand how these conflicting versions of history create more conflict on their own from the get-go. Like imagine if we're both having a conversation about someone called Robin. But the Robin that I'm talking about is a seven-year-old girl, and she's really great and does a lot of volunteering in her community. And you're talking about someone called Robin, who's a 50-year-old neo-Nazi serial rapist who just escaped prison. And I say, I just love Robin so much. Everything Robin does is so great. And you're like, what? Are you sick? How can you say that? What kind of monster are you? And that's it. End of conversation in five seconds and lots of mutual antagonism. And if you've ever tried talking about the Israel-Palestinian conflict outside of your own political bubble, you'll have seen this dynamic happen over and over again. One side says, Zionism is racism. And the other side is like, what? How can you think that? It's anti-Zionism that's racism. Or one side thinks, from the river to the sea means freedom and equality for everyone. What can be more moral than that? And the other side thinks that from the river to the sea is an obvious call to genocide. Both parties to the discussion are not operating on the same definitions or factual backgrounds. And so, every new event that happens in the conflict is interpreted through a lifetime of historical narratives and personal experiences that each person has in their head, so that even when people have the exact same facts in front of them, and even when they have the exact same kind of moral framework for what's right and what's wrong in the world, the common facts are interpreted in completely different ways. So when the 2,500 or so Hamas and allied militants escaped Gaza into Israel and massacred 800 civilians and 400 military personnel, often in extremely brutal ways out of a horror movie, one side, the people more sympathetic to Palestinians, were interpreting this as the obvious and inevitable outcome of what happens when you keep people trapped and oppressed for 75 years. And the other side, people more sympathetic to Israel, saw it as yet another example of unprovoked, belligerent hatred by people who would rather kill and be killed than accept a just and peaceful solution to the conflict, or to accept the existence of a Jewish state in the middle of the Arab world. Some of this is just the dynamics of identity. We explored a bit in the previous episode, and we'll look at it more in future episodes, that when people see themselves as part of a collective identity, even based on the most flimsy and ridiculous invented identities. Like, you take a room full of strangers, and you randomly tell every second person, you're in group A, you're in group B, you're in group A, you're in group B. And as soon as people get an identity, 
the members of each group start to discriminate against the people of the other identity group, inferring malicious motives to them. While at the same time, people quickly start to become biased in favor of the people of their own group, making excuses for them, assuming that they have good motives and that they're trustworthy. And all this is based on absolutely nothing, just arbitrary letter groups. This is clearly some kind of evolved mechanism, and I'm going to do an episode all about how the whole purpose of collective identity in evolution is genocide and exploitation, or else self-defense from genocide and exploitation. And while these kinds of dynamics obviously play a huge role in a conflict like the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, these kinds of dynamics can actually be circumvented more easily than the chaos dynamics caused by conflicting historical narratives can. Even for Jews and Arabs who have been raised since childhood with stories about this conflict as a central part of their identities. For example, there's a film called In Counterpoint from 2006, which is about a dialogue group for Israelis and Palestinians who've lost family members to the conflict, and the dialogue group is called the Bereaved Families Forum. And this is real stuff, like the Israeli parents of a victim of a suicide bombing sit down with the parents of the suicide bomber, and they share their experiences and tears and become friends. And it's incredible to see people connect on a human level, despite suffering these kinds of losses, and despite being on different sides of this seemingly impossible divide. But in that film, you don't see anyone at any point discussing politics or history. The film had a screening in my city, and the directors of the forum were present. And after the screening, when I asked one of the forum leaders why the forum members never talk about history or politics in the movie, and what happens at their meetings when people do talk about that stuff, his answer was, we fight. So group identification can be bypassed by common universal humanity, but historical narratives can't. Basically, people have an easier time bonding with and becoming personal friends with the parents of the person who killed their child than they do talking about the politics or the history of Israeli-Palestinian conflict. To bypass the tensions and chaos caused by conflicting stories and historical narratives, you need a new common story, some agreed-upon set of facts. No matter how open-minded and open-hearted you are, you can't really have a conversation until you understand the factual framework that the other person has in their head, at the very least. Otherwise, it's like talking two different languages, except it's worse, because when you're talking two different languages, you know that you can't understand what the other person's saying. But in this case, you think that you're talking the same language, and you think that you understand what they're saying. Once you understand who the other person thinks Robin is, then you still might think that they're completely wrong about everything, but at least you can understand why they think what they think, without thinking that they're insane, immoral monsters every time they open their mouths. And then, once you understand each other, you can actually start having the real argument that can lead to a resolution of the conflict, the one about the actual facts, the one that tells us who Robin actually is. In other words, you can actually establish a historical narrative that assigns responsibility to where it belongs. And once you've done that, you have room for each side to make some obvious, morally legitimate compromises. And you can expect a lot more willingness on the part of people on either side to make those compromises. And to agree on what those compromises should be. At least you can expect that from the general populations on both sides. Maybe not among the elites, meaning the people who make the decisions that everyone else is subject to. Because elites tend to want and tend to feel entitled to more power for themselves regardless of what's morally legitimate. And they'll just make up reasons why it's morally legitimate. And we all kind of do that, except that elites are in a position to actually make it happen, and the rest of us aren't. And when it comes to intercommunal conflicts, it requires not just looking at the actions of the Jews and the Palestinians, as if all the Israelis are one person and all the Palestinians are another person. We need to look at the various classes and factions within those groups who have conflicting interests, especially those people in a position to make decisions for everyone else and in everyone else's name. And once we do that, once we go back to the early years of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, the 1880s until 1948, and once we put some class analysis back into the story, and by class I don't mean capitalists and proletarians, I mean a more fundamental type of class meaning the class of people who make decisions versus the class of people who has to suffer the consequences of those decisions. Once we do that, then the conflict, which at first glance is seemingly all about identity politics, becomes a conflict about something very different. Instead of a story about Jews and Arabs fighting each other, the story becomes one about Jewish elites and Arab elites competing to see who gets to be the administrative elite of a new state, 
using identity politics to portray themselves as a representative of their respective identity groups, while they're actually needlessly putting their own population in harm's way, lying to them, exploiting them, and generating conflict where there could have been peace and cooperation had it been left up to the majorities of the people on both sides. And this applies right from the beginnings of the conflict, when you have the first series of clashes between Arab villagers and Jewish immigrant settlers, right up until today, where you have this hellscape war on Gaza. So in this series, we'll be focusing on two time periods. First, we'll be looking at how the conflict started, which means we'll be looking at the period when Zionists start immigrating to Palestine in the 1880s, until the state of Israel is born in 1948-1949. Because everyone interprets everything that happens today, or at any point, based on who they think started the conflict and why. And the dynamics are quite clear when we really look at this period in depth. And then, in a later episode, we're going to look at the failure of what's called the Oslo process, when Israel and the Palestinians were supposed to be on track to a two-state solution to the conflict, with an independent Israel and an independent Palestine living side by side, a solution which had majorities of people on both sides basically agreeing on the same solutions. Yet somehow, it ended up turning into a complete disaster, where today, both sides are more antagonistic towards each other than they've ever been, and aggressive right-wing elements have taken control over both societies. And we'll be focusing on Oslo because the turn to the extreme right on both sides, and the enormity of mutual mistrust and antagonism that exists today, is based on how each side interprets and understands why and how the Oslo process failed, but as seen through the lens of who started the conflict and why. So those are the two major periods we need to understand. Now, underneath all of the arguments that you'll hear about every single event that happens today, there are two underlying unspoken versions of why the conflict started. In the pro-Israel version of history, the main culprit is Arab intolerance of Jews. According to this narrative, the Jews immigrated to Palestine lawfully and acquired land by ethical and legal means and they became the majority, and therefore they had and still have the right to self-determination in the form of a state, the State of Israel. But, since the beginning, the Arabs could not tolerate the idea of Jews having a state or being in control of Arab or Muslim lands, so they've been attacking the Jews and trying to prevent the State of Israel from coming into existence from day one. And then, after the State of Israel was actually established, they've been trying to destroy it from that time until now. And no matter how ethically Israel conducts itself, no matter how many times it offers the Arabs a just and equitable peace, no matter how many times it offers the Palestinians a state of their own, the Arabs always reject it, and they choose war and violence because they value the destruction of Israel more than they value their own quality of life. And the crown jewel of this narrative is the failure of the Oslo process, where according to the pro-Israel version, Israel basically offered the Palestinians almost everything that they said they wanted, but they still refused it. And instead of making counter-offers or to negotiate a mutually acceptable settlement, they chose to walk out on the whole process and to start a violent rebellion with the intent of wiping Israel off the map. And this proved once and for all that there's no point of trying to have a peace process with the Arabs because they don't actually want peace at all. The only thing that they want and that they'll accept is to wipe Israel off the map and most of its Jewish inhabitants off the map as well. And this extends from the leadership of the Palestinians to the general population of the Palestinians who keep electing those types of leaders. And this explains a lot of the mentality of what's going on in Gaza today, where the entire civilian population is seen by many, many people on the Israeli side as the enemy. And from this point of view, any atrocities or brutalities committed by Israel, the occupation of the West Bank, the current flattening of Gaza, the building of Jewish settlements in the West Bank, the displacement of 700,000 or so civilians in the 1948 war. These are either legitimate actions taken in self-defense or for preemptive self-defense, or else they're regrettable or ill-conceived excesses undertaken in a conflict that is fundamentally the other side's fault. If you want to hear a very convincing version of this narrative, you can listen to Michaela Peterson's interview with author and corporate lawyer David Brog. And Brog has a book called Reclaiming Israel's History, from 2017. So according to this version of history, the current plight of the Palestinians in West Bank, Gaza, and the refugee camps in the neighboring Arab countries, their plight is all the result of endless Arab violence against Israel and against Jews, which forces Israel to do awful things to defend itself, like to keep up this 75-year occupation that they wish they didn't have to waste money and lives on.
And if you have the Israeli narrative as the background framework in your head, you immediately saw the October attacks against Israel not as something that can be explained in relation to anything that Israel does or has done, but rather as yet another example of the genocidal intentions and violence, not only of Hamas, but of the majority of Palestinian Arabs. And that's how Barry Weiss, for example, described the events, and also the protests and statements in solidarity with the Palestinians that came out right after the attacks. If you follow these types of writers and speakers, you'll often hear the expression that if the Arab militants would lay down their arms, there would be peace and prosperity for both sides. But if Israel laid down her arms, then there'd be genocide of all the Jews inside of Israel. And in the same vein, in regards to violence carried out by Israel, you'll often hear people quote the former Prime Minister of Israel, Golda Meir, from her 1973 autobiography, where she wrote, quote, When peace comes, we will perhaps in time be able to forgive the Arabs for killing our sons, but it'll be harder for us to forgive them for having forced us to kill their sons. Peace will come when the Arabs will love their children more than they hate us, unquote. And when Jews hear this, they solemnly nod their heads at how tragic the situation is and how endlessly bloodthirsty the Arabs are. And when Arabs hear this, they think, this is the most racist, psychotic, demented thing I've ever heard. And that's because the Palestinian version of history is something of a mere image of the Jewish version. And here, it's the Zionists and Zionism that have been the aggressors since the beginning. And we'll talk more about Zionism in a bit, but Zionism is generally the idea that Jews should have the right to establish a homeland where Israel is now, and where Palestine was before, and which was the site of the ancient Jewish kingdoms in biblical times. And in the Arab version, Arab hostility has always mostly been a function of not wanting to be disenfranchised and kicked off of their lands. The Zionist project of creating a Jewish state, by its very nature, required the expulsion of huge numbers of Arabs out of Palestine. And this was the plan of the early Zionists and the founders of Israel. And that's exactly what they did when they got the chance. That's why Zionism is a dirty word in the Arab world, or in some leftist college activist circles, like fascism or Nazism. In this understanding of history, Zionism implies that Jewish life is more important than Arab life, and that it was fair to build Israel at the expense of the native Arabs. As a member of the Palestinian elite told the British Empire's King Crane Commission in 1919, quote, we will push the Zionists into the sea, or else they will send us back into the desert. Unquote. So in this view, the aggressive stance of the Arabs is, and always has been, self-defense. Even if you're horrified by Palestinian attacks on Israeli civilians, like the dozens of suicide bombings against Israeli civilians on buses and public places throughout the 1990s, or else the Hamas rampage on October 7th, 2023, what do you expect when people have been pushed off of their land for 75 years and are still being pushed off of their lands today in a thousand little ways? A bit like the Nat Turner Rebellion was a gruesome event, but it was only understandable as a reaction to the injustice of slavery. And this is what Norman Finkelstein wrote about the October 7th attacks right after they happened. Or Columbia professor Joseph Massad of Princeton, a Palestinian Christian. He described the October 7th of tax as horrific, but he also describes them as a resistance to Israeli oppression and as retaliation for various Israeli crimes and abuses. In this version of history, Zionism is basically a typical racist 19th century colonialist movement with a few unique quirks, which inherently required, and still requires today, the displacement or disenfranchisement of the native Arab population in order to achieve its aims of having and maintaining a Jewish state. And if you want a very convincing view of this perspective, read Rashid Khalidi's The Hundred Years' War on Palestine, 1917 to 2017. And as always, there's a full bibliography in the show notes with all of the texts and videos and interviews that I mention or read to prepare this video. So, at the end of the day, in both of these narratives, each side sees the violence perpetrated by its own identity group as self-defense or preemptive self-defense, or at worst, exaggerated emotional responses to the endless onslaught of almost a century of violence or threats of violence against them. And the two narratives can basically be boiled down to Zionism is racism on the Palestinian side and anti-Zionism is racism on the Israeli side. These narratives see one nationalism as legitimate and the other as illegitimate. The Palestinians see Jewish nationalism, aka Zionism, as illegitimate because it implies taking someone else's land out from under them, and because it involves Europeans from Ukraine and Russia and Lithuania taking land that their ancestors hadn't lived in for 3,000 years, away from Arabs who had been living there for the last thousand years. 
and the Zionists see Palestinian nationalism as illegitimate because they see it as mostly invented in order to fight Israel. Like the Arabs of Palestine previously saw themselves as part of the broad Arab nation, or part of a greater Syrian cultural area, until they made up Palestinian nationalism in the 1930s to fight off the birth of Israel. And Palestinian only became a definitive identity group after the birth of Israel. And there's also a third type of narrative, which you see in a lot of history books, especially those written by left-wing Zionist scholars. And this narrative sees both nationalisms as legitimate, and sees the conflict as just the inevitable and unfortunate result of two legitimate nationalist movements fighting it out over the same piece of territory. And the results were tragic, but what happened has happened and it's now in the past, and today we just need to recognize the legitimacy of the aspirations on both sides and have a just two-state solution. And there's often a bit of subtext to that narrative, which says that, well, the Arabs already have 22 states. So Jewish nationalism is maybe a little bit more legitimate than Palestinian nationalism, because don't we deserve at least one little state in the world? And while I'm actually sympathetic to the 22 states versus one state situation, this is actually my least favorite type of narrative, because I think that nationalism is almost entirely idiotic and makes everyone stupid. And the whole narrative about dueling nationalisms has rotted everyone's brains and prevented everyone from understanding this conflict for the past 120 years. Aspirations for independence and democracy and cultural development are real and legitimate, but nationalism is a brain fog that gives cover to elites to use their supposed nations as cannon fodder in pursuit of personal and class power. And hopefully you'll see what I mean when we do the class analysis segment. Now when it comes to the pro-Israel versus the pro-Palestine narratives, each side's story has what I call ethical pillars, which hold up the belief system that justifies or excuses the actions of their particular side and condemns those of the other. The ethical pillar of the Palestinian story is that their violence is self-defense against expropriation and displacement, which are the original sins of Zionism. And the ethical pillar of the Zionist narrative is that Zionist violence is self-defense against racist and genocidal intolerance of the Arabs, which is the original sin of Palestinian nationalism in that narrative. Meanwhile, the dueling legitimate nationalism's narrative sort of presupposes that nationalism is always legitimate, and that everyone deserves a state. And the ethical pillar of that narrative is being totally oblivious to the fact that nationalisms are usually the tools of elites used to corral support and legitimacy for their own personal ambitions from a general public who is often in conflict of interest to those elites. Nationalism is all about erasing the conflict of interest between the leaders or aspiring leaders of the supposed nation and the rest of the nation. And we'll see that very clearly when I get into the class analysis of this conflict. Now, if we want to figure out the truth, the ethical pillars of these narratives are kind of pretty easy to test out. There have been violent clashes between Arabs and immigrant Jews in Palestine since Zionists started immigrating there in the 1880s. And these clashes continued and intensified right up until Israel's independence in 1948. What were these clashes about? Was it mostly about Arabs resisting domination, displacement, and expropriation by Zionists? Or were these attacks mostly xenophobic, anti-immigrant violence by Arabs against innocent immigrant Jews? And how did the Zionists acquire their land in Palestine in the first place? Was it ethical or not? What's particularly fascinating about doing this exercise of trying to test the ethical pillars of each narrative is that when you read Zionist or Palestinian histories of the conflict, it seems like no one else is actually asking these totally obvious and fundamental questions. And no one is taking a really serious look at these early clashes and at these Zionist land acquisition practices. Typically, on both sides, historians will barely even mention this stuff or else they'll just gloss over it or discuss it in passing without really focusing on what seems to me to be a central core issue and the ultimate way to prove the legitimacy of one or the other narrative. And in law, which I practice, when you see that your opponent seems to be avoiding what should be their own strongest argument, you realize that they're hiding something. And that's exactly what's going on here, but on both sides. And both sides are ignoring the same period of time and the same facts. And there's only one book that I know of that talks about these violent clashes in depth, the early violent clashes between Arab peasants and Jewish immigrants. And this book was only published in 2019. And it's called Ottoman Palestine 1881 to 1917 by Alan Doughty. 
And while it's really interesting and worth reading, it's also completely brain poisoned by the whole dueling nationalisms framework. And it sees all of these attacks as related to Arab nationalism, even though the author himself acknowledges that there was no nationalist ideology or sentiment among the peasants who were engaged in these attacks. And we'll look at all this in depth later, like why people need to inject nationalism into episodes where they know there wasn't any nationalism. The only writing that you'll find about early Arab-Jewish clashes and Zionist land acquisition that isn't poisoned by nationalist brain rot is in super specialized academic journals and books, which are in the micro domain of land acquisition in Palestine, 1882 to 1939, which no one reads besides other scholars in that field. Whenever you look at conflicts through the lens of dueling nationalisms, what you're actually doing is looking at the clash of interests between the elites in charge of the different societies and ignoring the relationship of those elites to the majority of the populations that they pretend to represent. Nationalism always covers up class. That's almost the whole point of nationalism, to erase class conflict in order to legitimize the rulers or aspiring rulers of the nation state and to hide their role as exploiters of the rest of the population. And that's why all of the histories about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict ignore these pivotal events surrounding Zionist land acquisition and early Arab-Jewish violence. Because when we investigate early Arab-Jewish violence and Zionist land acquisition policies, we inevitably end up pulling back the veil of these stupid stories of competing nationalisms. And instead, we discover a story of Arab urban elites versus rural Arab peasants versus Arab pastoralist nomads as well as an almost completely ignored history of Zionist elites and Zionist leaders of various Zionist agencies versus Zionist and Jewish immigrants fleeing persecution. And we also unveil stories of cooperation between Jewish immigrants and Arab peasants and Jewish and Arab wage laborers. And we see how this cooperation was sabotaged by both Zionist and Arab elites because it undermined their nationalist goals. So this is where we're really going to go in depth in the next episode. But first, for this episode, I'm going to do something unusual for this program. What I'm going to do is do just a basic ABC history of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict for all of those people out there, which I think is the majority of people, who just don't really have a good grasp on it. Skipping over big controversies and sticking to what most historians would agree to, regardless of their politics. So there's going to be a lot of passive voice going on here, and I'll be presenting the events with a lot of the moral context purposely removed. But then afterwards, in the next episode, we're going to go back to the beginning and inject class analysis into the story and see how the conventional narratives transform into something completely different once you do that. And so, let the cartoon begin. The area that's now called Israel and West Bank and Gaza was home to various nomadic and settled tribes and kingdoms and empires over the last several thousand years. And the first known ancestors of what are today called the Jewish people appear in some recognizable proto-Jewish form in the archaeological and historical record as Israelite tribes a bit more than 3,200 years ago. And while there's been a continuous Jewish or proto-Jewish presence in the area since that time, Almost all of the Jews were expelled from or left that region in two great forced exiles in 800 BC and 600 BC, and then in a subsequent long, slow, continuous wave of emigration that started in Roman times after the Romans crushed a big Jewish revolt in 136 AD called the Bar Kokhba Revolt. And from then on, most Jews have been living in what's called a diaspora or the exile, or galut, in the Jewish tradition, with communities spread out across the world, Europe, North and South America, modern-day Iraq, Persia, Northern Africa, Central Asia, and more, where Jewish people adopted local languages and customs, but kept similar variations of the same religion. Meanwhile, a small community had always remained in what came to be called Palestine. And the name Palestine, or Palestine in Arabic, is a variation of what that region has been called on and off by various empires since about 1200 BC. And after the Romans put down the Jewish Bar Kokhba revolt that I mentioned a couple seconds earlier, the Emperor Hadrian renamed the region from Judea to Palestine in order to stamp out Jewish insurgent sentiment and aspirations to independent statehood. And from that time, until Israel became an independent state in 1948, the region was called Palestine continuously. But it wasn't officially called Palestine the whole time. For example, in the Ottoman Empire period, before the British takeover, 
Most of it is called the province of Beirut and the district of Jerusalem. And Palestine was just an unofficial regional name, like Appalachia, or the Midwest, or New England in the U.S. By the mid-1800s, in the age of European nationalism, when Zionist ideas start emerging, the Jewish community of Palestine was generally poor and religious, and concentrated in a few towns and cities of biblical significance, especially in Jerusalem, which had, at that point, a Jewish majority. The modern Palestinians of today are descendants of a broad mix of people. In part, they're descended from the same collection of ancient tribes that the Jews emerged from, as well as from nomadic pastoralist tribes from all around the Arabian Peninsula who passed through that area of Palestine for centuries up until the 20th century, some of whom eventually settled down in Palestine at different points, becoming farmers and turning into peasants at different points, while others remained nomads in that general region. And a peasant is a subsistence farmer who is dominated by a state and who has to give part of his yield to that state and is exploited in various ways. The exploitation is what separates a peasant from a traditional subsistence farmer. That's part of the definition of peasant. And peasants are called fellahin in Arabic. In the 9th century BC, we start to have first records of people being referred to as Arabs which is the name that the Assyrians gave to the nomadic pastoralist tribes of what we call today the Arabian Peninsula. And that would have been the ancestors of today's Bedouin. With the Arab expansion and Muslim conquests of the 7th century AD, the Arabs became the ruling class of the Levant area, which today includes Palestine and Israel and Syria and Lebanon and Jordan and a bit more. And over time, the region becomes culturally Arab starting with the elite and the merchant classes, but then going down to the entire population. And the population of this area has always been racially mixed, with ethnic Arab tribes mixing in with people from Greek, Phoenician, Turkmen, Egyptian, Kurdish, Jewish, and Samaritan backgrounds. And then you add the Europeans during the Crusades, starting in the 11th century. So today, people who call themselves Palestinian Muslim Arabs might look like they're black from East Africa, all the way to looking like they have white pale skin with red hair and blue eyes. Before the conquests, Palestine was majority Christian, with predominantly Greek and Aramaic speakers. And then the population finally becomes majority Muslim after the 11th century AD. And today you have a small but influential Christian minority, and a smaller Druze minority. And the Druze are an Arab people who practice an interesting religion that's an offshoot of Islam mixed with Hindu and Greek influences. And of course, some of the Arab Christian communities of today are the oldest Christian communities in the world. Now, in the late 18th century to the late 19th century, you have the Haskalah, the Jewish Enlightenment in Central and Eastern Europe, which also affects Jews in Western Europe and in the Arab world. And it's a movement of cultural modernization, education, liberalism, learning of secular subjects. And while it favored the integration of Jews into their home societies, it was against the assimilation of Jews away from a Jewish identity. But in the 19th century, as nationalist ideas sweep across Europe, Jews get systematically excluded from their home national identities. And they also get excluded from the upward mobility of the middle classes, which accompanies the democratization of those societies. And in reaction to this, the Jewish Enlightenment starts to transform into the Zionist movement, which is basically Jewish nationalism, seeking a way for the Jews to advance and participate in modernization and self-determination, despite the obstacles placed on them by the nations of Europe. Nationalism is always invented and used to unite people that often have little in common. And the idea of Jewish nationalism might seem crazier than other types of nationalism because the supposed nation of Jews is spread all across the world, speaking different mutually unintelligible languages, having completely different cultures, often values and identities. A 19th century Jew in Morocco would be almost as different to a Jew in Ukraine as an Arab Muslim in Morocco would have been to an Orthodox Christian Ukrainian. Except that Jews were united by a common religion, a common religious language, Hebrew, and a minority status. But at this time, where Zionism was conceived of as a nationalism for all the Jews of the world, it was mostly of interest to the various European Jews who were undergoing the specific exclusions happening there at the time, particularly in Central and Eastern Europe. And we'll talk about Zionism in a bit more detail later, but there are basically two strains of Zionism at this time. 
One strain, which is called political Zionism, wanted to have a nation state for Jews as their priority. And it could be in Palestine or anywhere else in the world that would be convenient. And it would be a place where all of the Jews of the world could or would want to immigrate to. And then you had another branch of Zionism called cultural Zionism. And what they wanted was a Jewish cultural center, specifically in Palestine. And that Jewish cultural center would be a place that Jews around the world could look up to for intellectual and spiritual leadership. And that cultural center or national home could be a nation state, or it could just be an autonomous area that would be part of the Ottoman Empire, which is what Palestine was a part of at that time. Zionism becomes particularly popular in Eastern Europe, where the conditions of Jews are especially bad with these communities being subject to regular state-sponsored race-murder riots, basically, which become an institutionalized way for the ruling class to deflect popular unrest unto Jewish scapegoats, which is an age-old European tradition dating back to the Middle Ages. And as a result of Zionism and of worsening conditions for Jews in Eastern Europe, you start to get explicitly Zionist Jewish immigration to Palestine that starts in the 1880s. When Zionist immigration begins at that time, Palestine was a region of the Ottoman Empire, and if you're watching this on video, you can see that the Ottoman Empire in the late 1880s covers Turkey and Greece and Egypt and into what was Palestine and Lebanon, Syria, Iraq, Jordan, and the more populated parts of what's now called Saudi Arabia. In World War I, the Ottoman Empire joins the losing side, along with Germany. And the result of that is that after World War I, meaning 1918 and after, the Ottoman Empire disappears. And everything except for Turkey, basically, gets carved up by the various European imperial powers. And as part of that imperialist feeding frenzy, the former Ottoman province of Palestine ends up under the control of the British Empire, along with what are now called Iraq and Jordan, while France gets modern Syria and Lebanon. And just like you had the Jewish Enlightenment in Europe, in the Arab world you have what's called the Nahda, the Arab Enlightenment. This was a movement of secular, religious, and political modernization, democratization, anti-colonialism, liberalism, and there are some feminist currents in there as well. And just like with the Jewish Enlightenment, the Arab Enlightenment also makes a shift towards nationalism as it evolves. And where the nationalism of the Jews of Europe is motivated by exclusion, the Arab nationalist movement is in part a reaction against Western imperialism. And one of the big questions being debated was why has the Arab world and the Muslim world fallen behind the West? Arab nationalism begins a bit later than European nationalism and starts gaining some traction in the early 1900s after what's called the Young Turk Revolution in Turkey. But it doesn't really take off until the post-World War I takeover of much of the Arab world. Now the Arab world is enormous, spanning from North Africa to the Arabian Peninsula, with different traditions and customs and languages, and even the Arabic language. Like, Moroccan Arabic is basically a different language from Palestinian Arabic, which is different from Saudi Arabic, etc. And you have urbanites, nomadic pastoralists, peasants, and tribes and religions and sects and subdivisions within the religions. So, collective identity is a real web of overlapping affiliations. And even within a fixed territory, you'd understand your identity very differently as an urban elite versus as a nearby peasant or nomad. Tribal, religious, and class identities were generally more important than territorial identities. And territorial identities were usually very local for peasants, regional for nomads, according to their range of uh, travel, and much broader for elites, who were connected to each other by education and printed media in ways that, especially peasants, who were kind of stuck in the same place, weren't. So a specific identity connected to the territory called Palestine exists for some extent for some of the urban elite at this time, the late 19th century, but it doesn't really touch the peasant class until well until the 1930s. And we'll look at how and why that happens at that specific time in a bit. And Palestinian doesn't really become a primary identity unifying people of all classes until after Israel is created in 1948. So before 1948, we'll usually refer to the population as Arabs, and then after that, we usually hear them referred to as Palestinians, depending on who we're talking about. Because even today, it's not even the primary identity for a significant number of Arabs in and from that area. In particular, the Bedouin, who prioritize tribal identity. And also a significant portion of the Arab citizens of Israel, some of whom think of themselves as Palestinian citizens of Israel, while others see themselves as Arab citizens of Israel, or even Israeli Arabs, which is how the government likes to describe them. Now, in the late 19th and 20th centuries, there are different versions of Arab nationalism in Palestine. 
you had a pan-Arab vision of having one big homeland that would include ideally a big nation-state with a whole Arab world in it. And there were different visions for what this would look like, secular versus Islamic. And the Arab Christians are very much into the secular version of this because, of course, it would increase their status relative to what it would be in an Islamic version or what it was in the Islamic-identified Ottoman Empire. And there were also more regional ideas of Arab nationalism, where you'd see states based on the lines of cultural, religious, linguistic, and political variations of the Arab world. So in the different nationalist imaginaries, Palestine was often conceived of as being part of a larger Syrian state that would include modern Syria, Lebanon, Jordan, part of Turkey, most of Iraq, and northern Saudi Arabia. And the Syrian region shared cultural similarities and a mutually comprehensible version of Arabic. So often you'll see Palestine referred to as South Syria in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. But when the Brits and French take over different parts of the Arab world, it's clear that they're going to be separate Arab states, and that these states are going to be carved up according to the plans and interests of the European powers, and there's not going to be one big unified Arab state, and the states that are going to exist are not going to reflect the natural, cultural, religious, or linguistic regions of the Arab world either. So while the idea of a specific Palestinian state had not been part of any previous Arab concept of how the Arab world should be organized, the elite classes of the various Arab countries at this time want to become the elite classes of the new states, which are going to be emerging in these areas. And they start adjusting their nationalisms to reflect the new British-imposed reality. So in Palestine, you start to get at least the idea of a specific Arab state in Palestine though intellectually, pan-Arabism is still the dominant concept of nationalism. And the idea that you should have these separate states for Lebanon, Palestine, Jordan, Syria, etc., was seen by almost everyone as artificial meddlesome Western imperialism being imposed on the Arab world by force. Now in Palestine, very soon after the British take over, the British issue what's called the Balfour Declaration, where they promise Palestine as a, quote, national home for the Jews. And that's named after Lord Balfour, who issued the declaration, who was also a big supporter of a law restricting Jewish immigration to England. <laughs> and no one is exactly sure what was meant by a national home. And the official British line on what that meant kept changing because the Arab elites got really pissed off that they might not be the ones who get to be in charge of an eventual state. So due to pressure from Arab elite, the British then promised Palestine as an Arab state. And then they kind of go back and forth promising both Jews and Arabs independent states and entities in Palestine and redefining what that means and then allowing lots of Jewish immigration and land sales to Jews one year and then restricting it and banning them the next year, sometimes enforcing bans, sometimes not, often saying contradictory things to different people at different times or at the same time based on the interests of Britain at the moment, depending on whether they needed Jewish support or Arab support or both or often just to shut people up and to tamp down the unrest that was getting worse and worse among both Arabs and Jews in the area as time went on, for reasons that I'll explain in a bit. And unlike some of the other Arab territories that Britain managed to shape in its own interest to varying degrees, like what became Iraq and Jordan, when it comes to Palestine, the Brits realized that they had created a shit show that was just costing them resources and not really bringing them any of the benefits that they had hoped for. Now, Jews had been immigrating slowly from the 1880s until the 1930s, and much of the time there were as many Jews leaving Palestine as coming there, so the population grew very slowly in those first 50 years. But then, Hitler comes to power in Germany in 1933, and the prelude to World War II starts ramping up, and then World War II breaks out, and you have the Holocaust, which exterminates two-thirds of Europe's Jews, and which destroys most of the centuries-old Jewish neighborhoods and towns and communities across Europe forever. And as a result of all this, even though the vast majority of Jews are going to places like the U.S. and Canada, you start to get a massive increase of Jewish immigration to Palestine. So the Jewish community in Palestine as a whole hovers around 10% for several decades, once Zionism gets started, and it grows slowly, and then in small bursts whenever there's some kind of anti-Semitic riot in Eastern Europe. And after 50 years of immigration, the Jewish population is only at about 15 to 17 percent. But then from the time that the Nazis take over in Germany to the end of World War II, the Jewish population basically doubles. So you end up with about 30 to 40 percent of the population of Palestine being Jewish by the end of the war. And this generates further ab hostility from all classes, which we'll look at in a bit. Now from the 1880s to the 1920s, most Arab Jewish violence happens in rural settlements. But by the 1920s, you start to have urban anti-Jewish riots, particularly in 1920 and 1929. 
And we'll look at the differences between the rural and urban violence next time, as it's very illuminating to see what's going on in Palestine between Jews and Arabs, and different classes of Arabs and Jews. And then, from 1936 to 1939, you get what's called the Great Arab Revolt, which is extremely important, but it's also very overlooked and misunderstood. And we'll see why that is next time. But for now, we'll just say that where the Arab Revolt is usually described as being a nationalist revolt against British imperialism and Zionism, it would much better be described as a class war, with the peasants making war not only on the British and the Zionists, but often the main focus of their violence is against the Arab upper classes. During the revolt, the British hastily come up with the first ever partition plan and two-state solution to the Arab-Zionist conflict for both an Arab and a Jewish state in Palestine and a neutral territory made up of the holy places common to the Abrahamic religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. And the Jews accept it, and the Arabs are split, with some accepting it and others rejecting it. But the majority faction rejects it, and the Arab revolt rages on, and it's so intense that the British have to import a battalion away from Europe, where World War II is getting started, in order to put it down. And in putting it down, they end up arresting, killing, and wounding 10% of the Arab male population. And also to help put it down, the British make the Jewish military force, which is called the Haganah, an officially recognized allied force, and they help arm them, which gives the Palestine Jewish community one of the many advantages later when it comes to the big war that results in the creation of the State of Israel. And the Palestinian Jewish community is called the Yishuv. By the end of the revolt, the Brits have gained the hostility not only of the majority of the Arabs, but also of the majority of the Jews in Palestine. Because after the revolt is put down, just as the Holocaust is gearing up, and just as Jews in Europe need a place to escape to the most, the British promise to stop Jewish immigration to Palestine entirely, in order to satisfy the Arabs and prevent a continuation of the big revolt. And not only is that a disaster for Jewish refugees, given all of the other countries that were closing their doors to Jewish refugees at the time, but it also means that you'll never have a Jewish state in Palestine, because although the Jewish population doubled in a short period, the Jews are still only a minority of about 30 to 40 percent of the population. From then, although legal immigration is still strictly curtailed, you still get a lot of illegal immigration, with Jews being smuggled in in all sorts of ways and doing anything to escape the Holocaust and the whole time tensions between Jews and Arabs is mounting. And starting in the 1930s, you have a couple of right-wing Jewish terrorist organizations that emerge, the Irgun and Lehi, both of which were attacking Arab civilians, and one of which, Lehi, the much smaller one, is also an enemy of the British. And then in the aftermath of the World War II, countries all over the world are figuring out what to do with all of these Jewish refugees from destroyed towns and uprooted Jewish communities across Europe. And with all the people being freed from concentration camps and death camps, and all the people who had been fighting in the mountains and underground with partisan militias, but with no homes to return to because their towns and villages had been razed or their properties occupied by other people. And partly in response to this big refugee crisis, you have another partition plan made up by the United Nations in 1947. And you can see the map if you're watching the video. It's a very discombobulated map for a small area like Palestine, and the territory is carved up into four chunks, basically, like a weird checkerboard, based on where there are majority Jewish and Arab populations. And then Jerusalem, which both the Arabs and the Jews want as their capital, would be run by the United Nations as some kind of international capital of the Abrahamic religions. And when that plan is announced in 1947, Palestinian Arab militias, organized by the Mufti of Jerusalem, who was the British-appointed High Cleric of Jerusalem, and the most prominent anti-Zionist Arab nationalist in Palestine, these militias begin strikes and attacks on Jewish institutions aimed at preventing them from forming a Jewish state. And this turns into a civil war between Jewish and Palestinian Arab forces. And keep in mind here that from the Zionist historical narrative, the Zionists immigrated here fair and square and aren't displacing anyone, and a partition plan that creates a Jewish state in Jewish majority areas is just fair. And the Arab story is that the Zionists were planning to kick out the Arabs from the get-go, and the partition plan is just the first step in a larger expansion plan. So this is all self-defense as well. And two weeks into that civil war, the British are like, I, we're out of here, and they announce that they'll be leaving in the middle of May 1948. So the civil war in Palestine between Jews and Arabs keeps going until the British skip town on May 14, 1948. And on that day, the state of Israel is born, 
as the official Jewish community in Palestine declares its independence based on the discombobulated 1947 United Nations Borders Partition Plan that we just looked at, and that which triggered the civil war in the first place. And in part because the Jewish Yeshuv was armed by the British, the Palestinian Arab forces are no match whatsoever for the Jewish forces, but also for other reasons that we'll look at next time having to do with class. But shortly after Israel declares its independence, all of the neighboring Arab countries, modern-day Egypt, Syria, Lebanon, Iraq, and Jordan, along with some forces from Saudi Arabia and Yemen, they all come in and join the local Palestinian Arab forces against Israel. And they all have different motives for joining in, but basically no one, except for the leader of the Palestinian forces, wanted a separate Palestinian state to exist. The biggest reason that the Arab countries had for joining the war was that they wanted to prevent a flood of refugees from coming into their own countries. Because at that point, you had already had about 350,000 Arab refugees who had fled or been expelled from Palestine during the Arab-Jewish Civil War. In general, no one wanted a Western allied state in the middle of the Arab world. And several of them, like the rulers of Egypt and Transjordan, wanted to take chunks of Palestine for themselves. The king of Transjordan apparently was actually fine to have a Jewish state in Palestine, so long as he got to take the parts that had been demarcated to be an Arab country and he had an unwritten agreement with the Zionist leadership to that effect. Regardless of their actual intentions and goals, the Arab League, which was and still is today the official organization representing all of the Arab states, issued a declaration to the United Nations where they put forth that they wanted a single democratic state as the fair solution to the conflict, which would mean an Arab-dominant state since Jews were a minority in the former British Mandate of Palestine. By the end of the 1948 war, so in 1949, Israel wins and ends up with a significantly larger state than the one that they had originally declared based on the United Nations Partition Plan. The new borders take up 60% of the land that had been proposed for the Palestinian Arab state, leaving two Arab chunks, one on the east, which we call the West Bank, because it's on the west bank of the Jordan River, even though it's on the east of Israel, and that gets taken over by Transjordan. And on the west side, there's the Gaza Strip, which is taken over by Egypt. So the independent Arab-Palestinian state that was supposed to come out of this never happens. And very importantly, you end up with 700,000 or so Arab refugees who fled or who were expelled by Jewish forces about half during the Civil War and half after all of the Arab states had joined in. Now, until the late 1980s and early 1990s, it was consensus on the pro-Israel side that the 1948 refugees were the result of Arab forces ordering Arabs to evacuate so that they could attack more ferociously. And on the Arab side, it was always claimed that the Israelis expelled everyone on purpose according to a premeditated plan. But then in the late 1980s, Israeli archives were opened after the 50-year rolling blackout period, and historians got to access Israeli documents from 1948. And they found that Israeli forces deliberately expelled certain villages, but left others alone deliberately. And there were orders in some areas by Arab commanders for civilians to vacate in order to advance Arab war aims, but that a big chunk of the refugees in flight was just regular fear of war. Today, the debate among historians is about how much of the expulsions by the Jewish forces were premeditated and how much were just a real-time reaction to what was going on in the war, like clearing out villages that were attacking Israel versus those that weren't. And we'll get more into the details of this later when we explore class divisions among the Arab population. Who exactly was doing the fighting and who wasn't, and why? And remember that the Israeli narrative here is, we did everything morally. We immigrated here like normal people, and all you did is riots and pogroms against us, and then you started the civil war, and then all the Arab armies invaded to kill us unprovoked. So it's the Arabs' fault that all the refugees were created because the Arabs were the aggressors, and the Israelis cleared them out because they were a threat to the existence of Israel and to its Jewish inhabitants. And the Arab narrative here is, we attacked you preemptively to stop you from kicking us out, which is exactly what you did when you got the chance. And we'll see how much of this is true next time. Controversies aside, about half of these refugees were expelled by Jewish forces and half fled or evacuated. But by the end of it, 80% of the Arabs that had lived in the territory that became modern Israel were gone. And half of the Arabs who had been living in what had been previously called Palestine were displaced, either to the West Bank and Gaza or else into the surrounding Arab countries. <laughs> 
some of these refugees get absorbed into becoming residents of Jordan, or the West Bank, and Gaza. But a huge number of people, usually the poorest ones, end up in permanent refugee camps living in Gaza, West Bank, Jordan, Syria, and Lebanon. And all of those countries, except for Jordan, refuse to let them become citizens. And Israel won't let them back in either. So these people have been living in these permanent refugee slums, living largely on charity for 75 to 80 years now, several generations. So while May 14th is celebrated in Israel as Israeli Independence Day, the Palestinians mark it as a commemoration of the Nahba, the Great Catastrophe, where half of their population became displaced, and their seemingly interminable refugee and statelessness crisis was born. And of course, the Arab countries blame Israel for creating the refugees and not letting them back, and Israel blames the Arab countries for attacking Israel and for not letting the refugees immigrate to the Arab countries where they've been living for the past 80 years. And of course, everybody's right. <laughs> So by the end of the 1948 war, there were 650,000 Jews living inside of what became Israel, plus 155,000 or so Arabs, most of whom immediately become citizens of Israel. And this was part of the Zionist political vision from the beginning, to have a liberal democratic state with equal rights for minority citizens. And Theodor Herzl, one of the main founders of political Zionism, he had written a utopian novel about his dream state called Alte Neuland, Old New Land. And the main story is about how in the new Jewish state, there's a racist rabbi running for election who wants to restrict rights in the Jewish state to be exclusively for Jewish people. And he's eventually defeated by a coalition of liberal progressive forces, including Jews and Arabs and other minorities, who preserve the free and democratic character of the Jewish state. Except in real life, Israel wasn't exactly so liberal for Arabs. Until 1966, so for 18 years, Arab citizens of Israel were in a weird position of being able to vote and be elected to office, and you've had Arab members of the Knesset, the Israeli parliament, since the very first elections in Israel in 1949. But at the same time as they were getting elected to parliament, Arab citizens were subject to martial law in Arab majority areas, so they were not at all equal citizens. But in 1966, martial law is dropped, and Arabs are given full de jure equal rights. So that from then on, Arab citizens of Israel ironically have more rights in Israel than they do in most Arab-identified countries today. However, although rights have been equal on paper, Arabs in Arab-majority towns and municipalities in Israel don't get the same level of resources allocated to them as Jewish ones do. And new Arab municipalities often don't get officially recognized. And Arabs complain about other forms of discrimination, official and interpersonal which have intensified enormously after the massive attack on October 7th, 2023, where people are getting harassed and detained for tweeting things considered by the government to be disloyal. Though this also affects the tiny minority of left-wing Jews remaining in Israel as well. But people are getting arrested for saying things like, I cry for the citizens of Gaza, and innocuous things like that. And most of the residents of East Jerusalem, which is an Arab neighborhood, do not have Israeli citizenship or full rights, even though Israel basically annexed East Jerusalem into Israel in 1980. So you have official second-class citizens there. They can travel freely in Israel and they can vote in municipal elections, but they can't vote in national elections. And if they leave Jerusalem for too long, they can lose their right to stay there at all. And Israel actually offered citizenship to the residents of East Jerusalem in 1967 when they first took it over, but most of them declined, and we'll see why that is later. So today, the population of Israel is about 80% Jewish and 20% Arab. And the Arab population are 82% Muslim, 9% Christian, and 9% Druze. And about 16% of the Muslims are also Bedouin. And the Bedouin, of course, are traditionally a nomadic animal herding culture. For a few years after the 1948 war, you get this sad phenomenon where there are mainly peasant Arabs who had been expelled from or fled Israel in the war, and they would cross the border back into Israel from West Bank or Gaza and try to go back to their old houses, or else they'd try to go harvest their crops. And the Israeli army would go and kill them as infiltrators, which were portrayed by Israeli media as some kind of dangerous threat, which wasn't true at the time. And Israel killed almost 5,000 of these people from 1949 to 1956. But by around 1953, you start to get organized attacks from Arab militants, or Fedayin, mainly from the refugee populations. And they would come in from the West Bank and Gaza to attack Israelis and to destroy Israeli infrastructure. 
Unlike the peasant infiltrators, the Fedayeen were a real threat. And from 1954, the Egyptian government, under the Arab nationalist leader Abdel Ghanel Nasser, is helping to organize these raids. And then in response, Israel starts going into towns and camps where these raids are coming from to retaliate and punish them and prevent further attacks. And this keeps going on back and forth until 1967, when there's another important war between Israel and the neighboring Arab countries, this time Egypt and Jordan. In the past, this war was described as a war instigated by the Arab countries, or else as an Israeli preemptive attack, because Egypt and Jordan were getting ready to attack them first. More recently, historians have started seeing this war as a misunderstanding on the Israeli side, who made misinterpretations based on the hostile rhetoric of President Nasser and of his moving some troops around. And also, more recently, you have some who are starting to argue that Israel was using this as a pretext to attack first. And I honestly have no idea which version of this is true, as almost every major event in the history of the conflict has these types of contentious debates, and it just wasn't worth it for me to do a deep dive into this particular issue, because it's not important for this episode. But I did just want to mention it so that you can get an idea of how contentious so much of this stuff is, and how much of a deep dive you need to do in order to get your facts straight. Now, the reason I'm talking about this war at all, and what makes it so important, is not who started it or why, but that at the end of it, six days later, and it's often referred to as the Six-Day War, or the 1967 War, Israel wins again. But this time, it ends up in control of the West Bank and Gaza, where you have most of the original Palestinians and most of the refugees had fled or who got expelled from what became Israel in the 1947-49 to War. And Israel also takes what are called the Golan Heights from Syria and the Sinai Peninsula from Egypt. And unlike in 1948, Israel doesn't incorporate those territories as part of Israel. Instead, it militarily occupies them, which means Israel controls those territories under martial law, but the people living there don't have any of the rights that Israeli, Jewish, and Arab citizens have. And Israel's justification for taking those lands is self-defense to prevent all of these Fedayun attacks, which had been coming from these areas for the past 15 years. But despite the Israeli occupation, the Fedayun raids don't stop. Instead, the various Fedayun groups start merging together loosely under the umbrella of the PLO, the Palestine Liberation Organization, which was put together by the Arab League in 1964. And at this time, the PLO is run largely by educated middle-class Palestinians whose families had left Palestine in the 1948 war, such as Yasser Arafat, who grew up in Cairo and who was the leader of the PLO from a couple of years after its formation until he died in 2001. And the PLO at that time has a third-world socialist orientation, and the various Fedayeen groups that comprise the PLO are all different shades of Arab nationalists, social democrats, Arab nationalist socialists, Maoists, and Stalinists. Groups like Fatah, the most popular one, which has or had at least a social democratic orientation, but also groups like the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine and the Democratic Front for the Liberation of Palestine, which had Stalinist and Maoist politics. And the PLO was part political party, part militia, and its general goal was to replace Israel with a secular, democratic, or socialist Palestinian state, and to allow the return of all the Arab refugees to that state. Something worth mentioning is that it was the policy of the PLO at the time that all Jews who immigrated to Palestine since the advent of Zionism had to be deported back to where they came from. In 1967, the first leader of the PLO, Ahmad al-Shukairi, gave an interview on Lebanese radio where he was asked what would happen to the Jewish citizens of Israel if the Arab side would win what seemed to be an upcoming war, the Six-Day War, which would actually start two days after the interview. And Shukaidi answered, quote, We will endeavor to assist them and facilitate their departure by sea to their countries of origin, unquote. And about Israeli-born Jews, he replied, quote, Whoever survives will stay in Philistine, but in my opinion, no one will remain alive. Unquote. A few months later, in November 1967, in a special broadcast called To the Jews of Israel, which was broadcast in Hebrew by PLO Radio, Shukairi said, quote, Return to your countries of origin. Return to the places that you came from. Immigrate to a place where you will find a quiet life. One hundred thousand Arabs surround you. They will not leave Israel alone and allow it to exist. Search for peace and prosperity outside of Philistine. The Balfour Declaration that created a catastrophe brought on the immigration of Jews to Palestine. The catastrophe will end by immigration from Palestine. Unquote. 
And I bring this up because there's been a recent controversy about people chanting from the river to the sea at Palestine solidarity protests. And the reason that this is controversial is because from the river to the sea was a slogan from the 1960s when getting rid of all the European Jews was part of the PLO ideology. But by the end of the 1980s, the PLO changed their charter in that regard. And nowadays, most of the kids singing that chant are probably thinking about a democratic one-state solution with all of the Jews and the Arabs remaining there and staying together in a democratic state. But sadly, today in the West Bank and Gaza, the idea of deporting all of the Israelis back to where their parents or grandparents came from is once again gaining popularity, especially with a generation that grew up since the failure of the Oslo Accords which we'll talk about later. And the same is true for Israelis, where support for extreme solutions to the conflict, like expulsion of all the Palestinians from Gaza and West Bank, or for a straight-up apartheid state, and even for the expulsion of all the Israeli Arab citizens from Israel, has also increased significantly in recent years. And like with the Palestinians, that increase is especially pronounced among the post-Oslo generation. And we shouldn't forget that the Israeli right wing has also explicitly been using the phrase from the river to the sea since the 1970s to describe what they want, which is a Jewish state from the river to the sea. And the river is the Jordan River on the east to the Mediterranean Sea in the northwest. So in the original Likud party platform, and the Likud is the main right wing party in Israel that Netanyahu has been in charge of for decades now, it stated, quote, between the sea and the Jordan, there will only be Israeli sovereignty. Unquote. Another thing worth mentioning is that while the large majority of Zionists came from Europe, there was always a small but significant minority that came from the Arab world. From the very beginning in the 1880s on, from Morocco to Syria to Yemen, as well as Jews native to Palestine itself, Though, as we'll see next time, the Zionist Jews from the Arab world had a very different vision for what Zionism should look like than their European counterparts did. In general, though, Zionism was not a mass phenomenon among the Jews of the Arab world the way that it was in Europe. But then, starting in 1949 until the early 1970s, you had a mass wave of immigration of Jews out of the Arab world and into Israel, and also to other countries, mostly Canada, France, and the United States. By the early 1970s, the vast majority of all the Jews from the Arab world, almost 99% of a population of some 900,000 people, fled or were forced out of the countries that they'd been living in, sometimes for 2,000 years or so, since the great exiles that I described earlier. Ancient communities in North Africa, Egypt, Syria, Yemen, and many of them had been there long before there were any Arabs there, since pagan times. Baghdad, for example, was 40% Jewish, and most of the Jews there initially had very little interest in Zionism, as they were totally integrated into Arab culture. And they saw and described themselves as Arab Jews, much like the Arab Christians see themselves in various countries today, or like Jewish Canadians or Americans see themselves. But then, in World War II, in reaction to what was going on in Palestine, and often inspired by the Nazis, you start to get anti-Jewish violence in some of those countries. And then, after the establishment of Israel, anger against the expulsion of the Palestinians and the Jewish takeover of the Muslim Holy Lands, and the idea that the Jews are all traitors and agents of Western imperialism, fueled a wave of ugly, nationalist, anti-Jewish hysteria, which swept across the Arab world, accompanied by mounting anti-Jewish violence, often spurred on by the Arab nationalist heads of state. And by the 1970s, almost all of the Jews, not only from the Arab world, but also the Muslim world, places like Iran and Afghanistan. Almost all of them had fled or were pushed out of those countries. And these ancient communities, from Morocco to Egypt to Afghanistan, were almost entirely gone. And Israel tried to encourage as many of these people as possible to immigrate there. And Israel was so interested in this primarily because they needed laborers and because they wanted to increase the Jewish majority of the country as much as possible. And when they got to Israel, they were treated like shit kind of like the Arabs were, except a little bit better. They were pushed into the depopulated rural Arab areas and poor urban areas, often the Arab neighborhoods of various cities, and they were looked down on by the European establishment and expected to be cheap laborers and to assimilate away their languages and religious practices and culture in favor of European culture and practices. <laughs> 
which partially happened, but in many ways it never happened. And there was even a Black Panthers movement of Moroccan Jews against their economic and political situation, and the discrimination that they were subject to in the 1970s. And we'll talk about this movement more next time, because the Black Panthers started to ally with the Arabs in Israel, which completely freaked out the establishment. And it's one of the many examples throughout the conflict when nationalist leaders on either side sabotaged cooperation between Jews and Arabs and encouraged racism and nationalism. Today, more than 50% of the Jews in Israel originally came from the Arab world. And interestingly, these communities became the bedrock of the Israeli right wing in Israel. And today, they're often the most fierce and proud Zionists of them all. On one hand, this is because their experiences with Arab nationalism and Muslim domination pushed them to be fiercely suspicious of Palestinian nationalism and protective of the idea of a Jewish state where they can't be pushed out of, and also because it was the left-wing socialist Ashkenazi establishment, and Ashkenazi means European Jews, it was the left-wing Ashkenazi establishment that had been the ones in charge of the discriminatory practices against them, which pushed them into the arms of the right-wing parties, which gladly accepted them. Now, by 1971, it looks like the Israeli occupation is finally working from Israel's point of view because they basically crushed the Fedayeen inside of Gaza. In the West Bank, however, it's Jordan and not Israel who ends up crushing the Fedayeen. In a bloody civil war in 1970, known as Black September, in which three to 4,000 Palestinians were killed, as were about 1,200 Jordanians and Syrians, and three passenger planes were hijacked. Jordan hated the Palestinian militants because they were afraid of starting another war with Israel and also because the PLO groups were forming a state inside of a state in Jordan and you had the militant left-wing factions of the PLO calling for the overthrow of the monarchy of Jordan and of all of the other Arab monarchies. So Jordan wanted to nip all of this in the bud. After the Fedayeen groups get crushed in the West Bank and Gaza, the PLO militants move from Gaza and West Bank to southern Lebanon, which they basically run at that point. And from there, they start doing attacks back and forth into Israel, as before. And this is one of the catalysts for the Lebanon Civil War, which starts out as being between Christians and Muslims, and which goes on from 1975 until 1990. And I mention this because Israelis will often point to that civil war as an example of what will happen in Israel if there's ever a single democratic state shared by all of the Jews and the Arabs from the river to the sea. <laughs> After the 1967 war, you now have the state of Israel controlling these territories that aren't part of Israel. And Gaza and West Bank are the important ones because that's where you have the bulk of the Palestinians still living under Israeli occupation today. And these are the territories which are supposed to form the Palestinian state in all the two-state solution schemes that we'll talk about shortly. The other territories that Israel takes in the war don't really matter that much today in terms of understanding the ongoing conflict. Sinai, which is mostly desert and populated by nomadic Bedouin and a bunch of tourist resorts, was returned to Egypt in 1982 as part of a peace agreement, where Egypt became the first Arab country to recognize Israel as a legitimate state. And the Golan Heights in the northeast, which were taken from Syria, were annexed into Israel in 1981. And we don't hear very much about the Golan Heights anymore, even though Syria still wants them back, because the refugees that were created there in 1967 by Israel were absorbed back into Syria, unlike all the Palestinian refugees from 1948 and then 1967, who are still living in refugee camps three generations later, because the Arab states don't want to absorb them, and neither does Israel. So, since 1967, Israel has had control over Gaza and West Bank, which are populated mainly by Palestinian Arabs. And these are often referred to today as the Occupied Territories. Though since 1967, Israel has been calling the West Bank Judea and Samaria, which refers to what the north and south of the West Bank were called in biblical times. Another reason that the 1967 war is important is because after that war, the United States decides to adopt Israel as a client state. The Americans are impressed at how much Arab ass the Israelis can kick all by itself, and they realize that if they can make BFFs with Israel, they can have an easier time keeping all of the other Arab states and Iran under control in terms of not being a threat to global oil distribution. A lot of the governments of the Arab states, especially Saudi Arabia, are allied with the United States, but the populations of those countries 
hate the United States and often hate their governments, and they could be overthrown at any minute by a nationalist anti-American government, and that would jeopardize oil distribution. But if you have Israel there as sort of the watchdog of the United States, it's like having a permanent military force there, which can deal with hostile Arab states. So, since that time, the United States has been giving Israel enormous sums of money. And today, United States money makes up about one-fifth of Israel's military budget. And in many ways, the U.S. calls the shots when it comes to the boundaries of Israeli policies. Basically, by threatening to remove that funding, they can tell Israel what to do or what not to do. And the United States gives a similar but somewhat lesser amount to Egypt as well. And they've been doing that since 1978, when Egypt entered into an accord to make permanent peace with Israel. And they give that money to Egypt to keep them allied with Israel in order to help the U.S. control the Middle East. Another important thing about the 1967 war is that since Israel's victory, Israel started the establishment of what are called Jewish settlements inside of the occupied territories, though in most other languages they're called colonies. The governments of Israel have been mostly secular until recently, and they were mostly social democratic and socialist oriented until the late 1970s. But the people moving into these settlements are usually religious fundamentalists who want to reclaim the biblical land of Israel. So why did the socialist secular government of Israel fund religious fundamentalists to move into the West Bank? Well, when Israel took over those territories, there was a split in the ruling labor party about what to do with them. All factions in the Israeli labor party wanted settlements and wanted to annex parts of the West Bank for security reasons, in order to make it harder for future militants or Fedayun to attack Israel. The disagreement between the factions was where those settlements should be and how much of the West Bank should be annexed. The idea was either to bargain away the parts that they didn't annex, or to remove some or most of the settlements someday as part of some peace deal. And then you had the right-wing Likud and other right-wing parties that wanted settlements everywhere in order to make it impossible to give back any part of the West Bank to anyone whether it be Jordan or some future Palestinian state. So Israel over time built settlements in strategic locations, especially all around East Jerusalem, to make it harder to ever give back Jerusalem to Jordan or to in a future Palestinian state. And later they expanded the settlements into different blocks inside of the West Bank, which helped divide up the West Bank into areas that are easier for Israel to control and surveil. So when you hear people talk about Israel as an apartheid state, this is what they're usually talking about the occupied territories. Now what they mean, people who know what they're talking about, is that in the West Bank you have all of these Jewish settlers in these well-funded neighborhoods which have great services and full Israeli citizenship and rights and protection of the army and they're living in the midst of all these Palestinian Arabs who have no citizen rights, who have crappy services and who are subject to military control. Or, alternately, if somebody's talking about apartheid, they might be talking about how within the territory that Israel now essentially controls, meaning Israel, West Bank, and Gaza, you have all these people in Gaza and West Bank that don't have equal rights to the citizens of Israel. But that analogy isn't great, in my opinion, because the Arab-Palestinian citizens of Israel, who do have full citizenship rights despite various kinds of discrimination. <music> Until the Oslo Accords that we'll talk about in a second, the occupied territories were entirely under Israeli martial law, and the Israeli army would carry out collective punishments if someone was found to be part of a militant organization that calls for the end of Israel, or that carries out attacks into Israel. For example, Israel would bulldoze the home that the militant lived in as a punishment. And because the streets are super narrow in much of the Palestinian territories, this giant bulldozer would sometimes rip up the walls of all the buildings on the block on its way to the Targa building. So the occupation is totally hated for this and for many other reasons. And you can look at the organization called Breaking the Silence, which is Israeli soldiers who are whistleblowers about the way the army treats Palestinians in the occupied territories. And of course, there's been a ton of reporting on this from Palestinian sources for decades. And it's gotten much worse in recent years as Israeli soldiers tend to be much more supportive of the various abuses carried out by the Jewish settlers against the Palestinians. And as Jewish-Israeli society becomes more and more hostile to Arab society because of the aftermath of Oslo. Now, still in 1967, after the Six-Day War, the United Nations Security Council issues what's called Resolution 242 which calls for Israel to withdraw from all the occupied territories and for all of the Arab countries to recognize Israel as a legitimate state as per the borders it won after the 1948 war. 
And I mention this because people often cite this resolution as where the borders for the two-state solution are supposed to be. So you'll hear people talk about the 1967 borders, and basically they mean the borders of Israel before Israel took over the West Bank and Gaza. Now in 1977, Likud, the main right-wing party in Israel, which Netanyahu today is the head of, or he was when I recorded this, hopefully he'll be gone soon, In 1977, Likud gets elected for the first time after 30 years of social democratic and socialist coalition parties. And part of Likud's ideology is that they want all of the territory from the Jordan River to the Mediterranean Sea to be part of Israel proper. So when they're in power, they push the settlements further with that goal in mind. And they do this every time they're elected. Add more settlements, let more people move into the settlements, expand the existing settlements. In the past, the Jewish settlers were kind of widely seen as maniacs by much of the rest of the population. But since the collapse of the Oslo Accords that we'll talk about shortly, the Israeli population has veered far to the right, much closer to the ideology of these settlers, so that their ideas are mainstream today. Now, I'm going to skip over a bunch of important things, like the 1973 war started by Syria and Egypt, and then there's a war with the PLO in South Lebanon in the early 80s, and then there's the occupation of South Lebanon, and Israel only pulls out in 2000. But we're going to skip all of that, and we're going to fast forward to 1987, when there's a big uprising in the Palestinian territories against the Israeli occupation. This big uprising is called the Intifada, which means uprising or shaking off. And this uprising really puts the world's attention on the occupation and the conditions of life for the Palestinians living under it. So the Intifada lasts for six years, and during which the Israeli army kills about 1,200 Palestinians, including two to 300 children. And somewhere between 60 to 120,000 Palestinians were arrested, and around 200 Israelis were killed, and 3,100 suffered injuries, about half of them soldiers, half of them civilians. By the end of it, In 1993, the Palestinians had gotten a lot of sympathy from around the world, and also a certain amount of sympathy from inside of Israel itself, who was also watching what was going on inside the Palestinian territories. And there was growing public support inside of Israel for ending the occupation, which many Israelis were against from the very beginning. And it was a big tenet for a lot of Israelis and Jews around the world that Israel was supposed to be a place where Jews can escape oppression, not just another country like other countries that oppresses other people. So the occupation was seen as a great shame. And on the Palestinian side, you also get something new, which is that you have people starting to call for a two-state solution to the conflict, as opposed to the expulsion of all the Jews, which was the PLO's original position, or as opposed to the single democratic state with all the Israelis and Palestinians in it, which became the position of some of the socialist factions of the PLO. So in 1988, the PLO makes a declaration where they basically accept the United Nations Resolution 242 that I mentioned a minute ago. And what that means is that the PLO accepts to recognize Israel according to its post-1949 borders after the War of Independence. And they call for a Palestinian state in the West Bank and Gaza. But they were also calling for all of the refugees who had fled or been expelled from what became Israel to be able to come back to Israel, which would, in practical terms, mean that Israel would end up with around 50% Arabs and 50% Jews, which in practical terms means that there would be no more Israel as a Jewish state. So many Israelis and supporters of Israel were not impressed with this as a sign of progress, and they saw it and still see it as disingenuous public relations. Though others saw it as a huge leap from the PLO's early positions, and they assumed that the right of return for Palestinian refugees was a statement of principle that in practice would be bargained away at some point. Now, during the Intifada period, you also have the formation of religious militia groups like Hamas and Islamic Jihad. And these militias stood out in stark contrast to all of the secular socialist PLO factions that had emerged in the 1960s and which had been dominant ever since. And people think of the rigid Islamic fundamentalists of groups like Hamas or Al-Qaeda as an ancient traditional phenomenon, but it's actually quite modern. It starts in the late 1800s as a reaction to industrialization and also Western colonialism. And it picks up in the 1930s and again in the 1980s, where it really spreads across the Islamic world. And ironically, one of the big reasons for why it spread in the 1980s was that the United States was funding fundamentalist jihadis to fight the Soviets in Afghanistan, and they were encouraging Saudi Arabia to fund and promote these kinds of ideas all across the Muslim world as part of that effort. And, fun fact, which we'll talk about more later, Israel actually supported Hamas and helped them get off the ground right from the start. At that time, 
like I just mentioned, the Palestinian cause was gaining global sympathy because of the Intifada, and the PLO was becoming more moderate in its messaging, and it was unifying all of these various factions of political society to a new degree. So Israel didn't trust the PLO's turn to moderation or its call for a two-state solution for a second, and they believed that the PLO's ultimate goal was still the destruction of Israel, whether it be via terrorism or else by diplomacy or both. And so, the Israeli government supported the rise of Hamas in order to sabotage the PLO and Palestinian unity, and the Palestinian cause in the eyes of the world. In terms of PR, Hamas, as an extreme right-wing religious faction, was highly antagonistic to the socialist secular PLO factions, and the violent religious fanaticism of Hamas put an ugly face on the Palestinian cause, versus the sympathetic image of poor Arab teenagers facing Israeli tanks with slingshots that had emerged during the Intifada. And this PR war was crucial to Israel, because it depends so much on aid from the United States and from donations from Jews around the world. So the fact that Jews around the world, and especially in the United States, were starting to sympathize with the Palestinian cause was seen by the Israeli establishment as a mortal danger. And infamously, this support for Hamas helped fund the most recent Hamas attacks in Israel on October 7, 2023. Bibi Netanyahu, the right-wing prime minister of Israel, who'd been in power on and off since 1996, his deliberate policy, which he'd been bragging about to his own party as late as 2019, has been to support and fund Hamas in order to keep the Palestinians divided and to make the Palestinians look bad in the world's eyes, with the ultimate goal of making sure that a two-state solution never happens. And you can see his speech on that linked on the show notes. So, in 2020, Qatar, which funds Hamas, was pissed off with them and was going to cut their funding. And Netanyahu hears about this, and he flips out and sends an envoy to push Qatar to make sure that they keep funding Hamas without interruption. So Qatar goes back to funding Hamas, and Hamas spends the next three years taking that money and preparing for the October 7th murder rampage. And this sounds like a conspiracy theory, but it's been all over Israeli media, and the people there are pissed. But the people are letting him keep charge of the country as part of this national unity war effort. And Netanyahu could be charged with all kinds of criminal things, so he's just like staying in power and keeping the war going as long as possible so that he doesn't get kicked out of power and doesn't end up going to jail. Back to 1991, when the Intifada is still going on. Israel starts negotiating directly with the PLO for the first time ever. And in 1993... Once the Intifada is finally over, Israel and the PLO enter what are called the Oslo Accords. And they're called that because they're signed in Oslo, Norway. And the idea behind the Oslo Accords is that there'll be some kind of two-state solution based on that UN Resolution 242 that I've been talking about, meaning that it'll look something like Israel's borders did after the 1948 war, but where Gaza and West Bank will become a single Palestinian state joined by some kind of highway, her bridge, instead of belonging to Jordan and Egypt, as they had before, and Israel will end the military occupation of West Bank and Gaza, and the PLO will become the democratically elected government of Palestine. And the PLO and the new Palestinian state will recognize Israel as a legitimate state, and the other Arab countries will follow suit, and the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and the broader Arab-Israeli conflict will finally be over. And in the interim period, while they work out the details, Israel hands over control over parts of the West Bank and Gaza to what would be called the Palestinian Authority, or the PA, which at first would be just the PLO's political wing, basically, but eventually there'd be democratic elections with different factions represented, and eventually the PA would be the government of an independent state of Palestine. So in this interim period, the Palestinian Authority would control the cities and towns, and Israel would control everything in between. And despite the fact that most people on either side of the conflict think that the whole conflict is the other side's fault, this two-state Oslo concept has majority support on both sides. And there's a lot of cautious optimism around it, even though there's a lot of skepticism all around as well. The whole concept, of course, is vigorously opposed by the right-wing elements in Israel and among the Palestinians. On the Israeli side, like I said, the right-wing was always against the two-state solution from the beginning. But the extreme religious parties, and especially the settlers, were vehemently opposed. 
not only because they'd have to give up their claims to Judea and Samaria, but also because most of the settlers would have to be forcibly removed from their settlements and relocated back to Israel, or else face being a Jewish minority in a Palestinian state. And on the Arab side, you had fierce opposition from the right-wing militant groups like Hamas and Islamic Jihad, who wanted to wipe out Israel and establish a theocratic dictatorship, and also from the socialist PFLP, who rejected two states and insisted on a single democratic state. And this opposition to Oslo and the two-state solution was often very violent. So, for example, Yitzhak Arabin, the Israeli prime minister who signed the Oslo Accords, gets assassinated in 1995, two years later, by a right-wing Israeli for being a traitor. And during the years of the Oslo process, Hamas would try to derail any progress by sending young men to do suicide bomb attacks against Israeli citizens inside of Israel, blowing themselves up on buses and in other public places. Now, while there's a broad public consensus on what the two-state solution should look like, there are still some contentious issues. Like, Israel wants all of Jerusalem, but the Palestinians want the Arab part of Jerusalem to be the capital of Palestine. And there are issues about who will control the big water aquifers in Palestinian territory that both Israelis and Palestinians depend on. And how many of the Palestinians, or their descendants, who were expelled or fled in the 1948 and 1967 wars, would be able to return to Israel? Millions of Palestinians were still stuck in refugee camp neighborhoods decades later, and they would want to return to Israel, which would mean the end of Israel as a Jewish majority state in the long term. But most people talking about the conflict expected that both sides would eventually agree to a limited number, a few hundred thousand, and then the rest would be expected to return to the new Palestinian state as full citizens, or maybe finally be absorbed into the other Arab states where they'd been living as refugees for the past 80 years. And then there's the issue of how many of the Jewish settlements would Israel remove from West Bank? Would it remove all of them, like the UN 242 resolution demands? Or would it keep a bunch of them and annex them into Israel, as the Israeli establishment had originally intended when they started building the settlements after 1967? And how much would Israel annex? And how much would it give back to the Palestinians? So, there are important issues to work out, but there is broad acceptance of the main idea. Now, despite so much initial hope and optimism and goodwill on both sides, Oslo implodes, and implodes spectacularly. If you want to understand the current situation, why both Israel and Gaza have been run by right-wing extreme maniacs for the past 20 years, with Hamas carrying out bloody massacres and Israel flattening Gaza, making it uninhabitable and making 2 million people homeless, or why the West Bank hasn't had legislative elections since 2006, or why only a minority on either side now of Arabs and Jews in Israel believe a peaceful conflict to the resolution is even possible. The answer to how things got so bad today lies in how people on either side of the conflict understand the failure of Oslo in the context of how they understand who started the conflict. Now, the conflicting narratives around what happened during Oslo and why it failed are so important that I think they'll need a whole episode to themselves. But if we want to understand what's happening right now, what matters is the story that was told to both the Palestinian and the Israeli populations about why Oslo failed each side was basically told a mirror image version of the same story. Each side was told that the other side was just lying the whole time of the Oslo Accords and the Oslo process, and that they had no intention of actually agreeing to a real two-state solution, and they were just using the years spent in negotiation to advance their plans of basically conquering all of the land from the river to the sea. The thing you'll most often hear if you talk to Israelis and supporters of Israel is that Israel offered the Palestinians almost everything that they said they wanted, a full state in Gaza and West Bank. And instead of accepting it or negotiating, the Arabs just walked away and said no to everything without even negotiating or making counteroffers. Yet again, the Arabs chose violence, and they started the second intifada, which we'll talk about in a second, in order to destroy Israel. And the whole time of the Oslo process, the Arabs were stockpiling weapons for that purpose. And we can't have a two-state solution because they don't want one. They want everything. And they never have and never will accept Israel as a legitimate state because they hate Jews and can't accept the existence of Israel on their holy lands. And that's how it's been since the very beginning when they opposed Zionism and the idea of a Jewish state out of racism and intolerance. And on the Arab side, you'll also hear that the Oslo process was a big sham from the get-go, a ruse to conquer the Palestinians forever, 
And you'll hear people say stuff like, well, before the Oslo process, the occupation was bad, but you could still go from Jerusalem to Gaza without much hassle. And you could travel from one part of the West Bank to the other, and it wasn't so complicated to go work inside of Israel. But once Oslo starts, all of our freedom of movement was taken away. The Israelis started putting up all of these checkpoints everywhere and intensifying the existing checkpoints so that now it would take hours to pass. And if you wanted to go from your village to the nearby town, which would normally take 15 minutes, now it took six hours. It was much harder to go in and out of Israel to work. And while we're supposed to be negotiating for our independent state, the Israeli government keeps allowing the Jewish fundamentalist settlements inside of West Bank to keep growing and growing, and they even build new ones. And thus, Israel was just using Oslo as an excuse to steal more and more land. It's like negotiating over a pizza while one side keeps eating the pizza. And thus, Israel was just using Oslo as an excuse to steal more and more of our land. They had no intention of giving us a real state. They just wanted to give us a version of the occupation where the Palestinian government controls garbage collection and Israel controls everything else. And they wanted to be able to call it a Palestinian state, just like South Africa created what were called Bantu stands which were supposedly independent black-run states, but which were ultimately controlled by white South Africa. So in this version of the story, it's Israel that rejected a just peace. From the beginning, the Zionist project was to take all of historic Palestine. They stole 77% of Palestine in 1948, and now they want to steal the other 22% that they're pretending to offer us. So despite all of the hope and quasi-consensus, you end up with this total catastrophe, where we end up where we are today with neither side having the slightest bit of trust in the other side, or any hope for peace. Now, rewind to right before the big failure of Oslo. There's this big, hyped-up summit at Camp David in 2000, hosted by Bill Clinton, where the expectation is that the big deal might be made then and there. But Arafat, the head of the PLO, walks out, rejecting the Israeli offer without making a counterproposal. The American and Israeli media report that Arafat rejected what he said he wanted from the beginning. And Bill Clinton presents the same story, while the Arab media report that Arafat walked out because the Camp David proposal was an insult. It wasn't a real state at all. It would be a Bantustan state. Israel would still basically be in control of Palestine, but it would be called a sovereign state for global PR purposes only. And at this delicate moment, when there's still hope for peace, but major disappointment on both sides, you have Ariel Sharon, who's the leader of Israel's big right-wing Likud party, which, as we noted earlier, was always against a two-state solution from the beginning. And Sharon is also known as a war criminal to Arabs for a civilian massacre that happened in the Lebanon war in the Beirut neighborhood of Sabra and in the Palestinian refugee camp nearby called Shatila. Now Sharon goes and he stages a deliberately provocative visit to a holy site that's shared by Jews and Muslims, called the Temple Mount, which is the holiest site to Judaism, the remains of the ancient temple that's the center of ritual in the Old Testament. And then the Romans tore down that temple, and then in the 7th century in the Muslim conquest, the Muslims built the Dome of the Rock on top of the remains of that temple. So Sharon goes to pray at the Temple Mount, surrounded by riot cops. And that erupts into protests and rock-throwing by Arabs, and then retaliation by Israeli riot police. And it escalates and degenerates into another protracted intifada. But this second intifada is a much more bloody uprising than the first one, on both sides. Israeli police shoot protesters with live bullets. Hamas and other Palestinian militants execute a spate of suicide bombings, targeting civilians. Many Arab neighborhoods get bulldozed. Tens of thousands are imprisoned. And as usual, the death toll is like 10 times more Arabs killed than Israelis. The Israeli prime minister at that time, in 2000, Ehud Barak, who presided over the failed Oslo negotiations, comes off looking like a loser to the Israeli public for having failed. And the left, in general, looks like fools for having convinced the country that the Arabs could be trusted and that this peace process ever had any chance of succeeding. And on the Palestinian side, Arafat, who had been looking more and more like a sellout during the Oslo process, comes off as looking strong and heroic for having rejected a terrible, unfair deal under pressure from the United States. Soon after, there are elections in Israel, and the Labour Party, which had dominated Israeli politics since 1949, is almost totally wiped out and never recovers. And Sharon, the right-winger who triggered the second intifada, is elected prime minister. Now since that time, more than 20 years ago, this is in 2001, elections in Israel have been competitions to form coalition governments between the center-right, the right, and the extreme-right. 
and the word leftist is a derogatory slur that means a mix between traitor and naive idiot. The whole idea that you can ever make peace with Arabs is now seen as a fairy tale that only crazy communists on kibbutzes and old people still believe in. Most of the people who used to believe in a two-state solution now think that they were duped and that the right-wingers had been correct all along. And things got much worse for the Palestinians in West Bank and Gaza from that point on. To punish them for the suicide bombs and the intifada and rejecting the Oslo offers, and to prevent more attackers from entering the country, Israel basically shut down most of the work permits into Israel, which had been a huge chunk of the Palestinian economy, which half the population had depended on. And instead, they started bringing in people from Sudan and other parts of Africa for their labor needs. And since then, the Israeli media no longer reports much on what's going on in West Bank and Gaza, so Israelis sort of forget about them, except once every year or two when Hamas starts shooting rockets into Israel, or there's some other conflagration. The fact that you had a big music rave festival just three miles away from the border, where those people got massacred on October 7th, is a sign of how distant the lives of people in Gaza and West Bank are from the popular mind in Israel. <laughs> In 2005, Israel withdrew all of its troops and removed all of the Jewish settlements from the Gaza Strip. And they did this for strategic reasons. Basically, it's less costly and less of a PR blunder to contain Gaza from the outside than from the inside. And according to the statements of various leaders of Israel at the time, they were worried about Israel looking like an apartheid state especially if the population of people in the territories that it controlled in the West Bank and Gaza started to outnumber the population of Israel. So get rid of half of that population by withdrawing from Gaza. And there's a debate as to whether or not it's actually technically occupied or not, because there are no Israeli troops on the ground, at least there weren't before the October 7th war. But regardless of that debate, it's generally not considered to be an independent state of any kind because Israel still controls Gaza's water, electricity, telecommunications, and Israel and Egypt together control what goes in and out of Gaza and the borders, and Israel also controls the air and maritime space, and they also maintain a no-man's buffer zone inside of Gaza itself. Since Hamas took over power in Gaza in 2007, which we'll discuss shortly, Gaza has been under a very severe blockade from Israel. It's supposed to be for security reasons, but since the beginning, there have been chronic shortages of basic medical supplies, and there have been food shortages, and much of that is the blockade, and part of it is also that Hamas focuses their budget on their military, and on benefits for their own members, instead of things like feeding its population, or even defending them from Israeli attacks and retaliations. And all of this has led to widespread dissatisfaction with Hamas's rule among the residents of Gaza over the years. Most of the population of Gaza has never been outside of Gaza in their entire lives, because at this point, the borders have been closed and work permits into Israel have been minimal since the Second Intifada, more than 20 years ago, and half the population is younger than 20 years old. At first, Gaza was controlled by the same Palestinian Authority as the West Bank, but in 2006, the Palestinians held legislative elections and Hamas narrowly beat Fatah, which is the biggest party of the PLO, 44% to 41%. Polls showed that two-thirds of the Palestinians who voted believed that Hamas should change its policy of rejecting Israel's right to exist, and that most supported a two-state solution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And the polls indicated that Hamas's victory was due largely to Palestinians' desire to end corruption in government, rather than specific support for Hamas as a theocratic Islamist political organization. And Hamas ran under the name of the Change and Reform Party for that reason. Regardless of this, Hamas and Fatah ended up in a mini-civil war, where hundreds of people from either party are killed. And this splits Gaza off from the West Bank, with Hamas taking control of Gaza and the PLO maintaining control over West Bank. And the irony of this is that it was the United States who pushed for the Palestinians to have these elections, and who also pushed for Hamas to be allowed to field candidates. But when Hamas actually won, which was a huge surprise for everyone, including Hamas, it was also the United States that insisted that Fatah, the party that lost the election, refused to concede power, which triggered the civil war. And people often say that Hamas taking over Gaza was a coup, but it's actually Fatah that did the coup in the West Bank to stay in power, because they lost the election. And there haven't been any elections in Gaza since that time, 17 years ago, and in West Bank they've only held municipal elections, with the president and legislature being the same for the last 17 years. <laughs> 
and Israelis and Palestinians have been living in this reality ever since. No serious peace prospects, a couple of peace offers made since then that went nowhere, a tightened occupation with no prospects of ever loosening. Every year or so you have episodes of Hamas and Islamic Jihad shooting rockets into Israel from Gaza with massive retaliations from Israel. And in the West Bank, you have an escalating cycle of violence and death, where so-called price tag gangs of Jewish settlers burn down the homes of innocent Palestinians and carry out collective punishments any time an Arab attacks or kills a settler, which leads to more and more attacks. And nowadays, the Israeli army just backs up the settlers instead of curbing their abuses. The current Israeli minister in charge of West Bank, when I'm recording this, Bezalel Smotrich, is a settler himself and the government keeps looking for more and more excuses to confiscate more and more Arab land. Every few years, you have a more prolonged conflict with Gaza. But basically since 2014, when you had the last big conflagration between Gaza and Israel, the Israeli public has sort of forgotten about the Palestinians, as has the world in general. So after 80 years of conflict, and of all the Arab countries staunchly rejecting Israel's legitimacy, in 2020, Israel managed to start signing various agreements with Arab states, establishing diplomatic relations with them for the first time, with Morocco, Sudan, Bahrain, and the United Arab Emirates. And they've all quietly let go of their insistence on an end to the occupation as a prerequisite for normal relations with Israel. Polls taken in Gaza right up to October 7, 2023, show that the people in Gaza blamed Hamas more than they blamed Israel for their chronic lack of food. The population sees Hamas as corrupt, and at that time they barely had 18% support. Fatah, the main PLO organization in charge of the Palestinian Authority and West Bank, were even less popular, and the leaders of both Hamas and Fatah would have lost elections by landslides at that point. And then boom! On October 7, 2023, on the Jewish holiday of Simchat Torah, an alliance of Palestinian militant groups led by Hamas carried out a coordinated attack on Israel where 2,500 or so fighters escaped from the Gaza Strip and entered into Israeli towns and cities by paraglides, motorboats, and on foot, where they murdered more than 800 civilians and about 400 military personnel, with another 250 or so civilians and military taken as hostages. Most of the militants had never been outside of Gaza in their lives, and some of the murders they committed were horror stories adapted to the social media age, throwing grenades inside of bomb shelters, torture and murders that were filmed and then broadcasted by the militants on the victims' own Facebook and Instagram accounts on their phones so that their friends and families would see them on their feeds. And the Arab fighters ran around attacking and kidnapping people inside of Israel for several days before the Israeli forces could stop them, which is shocking given how powerful and well-funded the Israeli army is supposed to be. It took several hours for Israeli forces to even appear, which is incomprehensible given how small Israel is, and how many warnings the government had that this was going to happen. The lag in response time of the Israeli army is explained by the fact that so many Israeli soldiers were deployed on the other side of Israel in the West Bank in order to back up settlers who had been attacking innocent civilians for weeks, and then to defend them from violent responses from the Palestinians. On October 9th, Israel's defense minister, Yoav Gallant, announces a complete siege of Gaza, in which he says that no electricity, no food, no water, no fuel would be allowed in, and a massive bombing campaign ensued, which goes on until today when I'm filming this in early 2024. And since Gallant's announcement, Israeli officials and military commanders have been telling Western media that they are doing their best to prevent harming civilians, while announcing over and over again in Israeli media, and sometimes in Western media as well, their intent to destroy Gaza, to make it uninhabitable, and to remove the population of Gaza to other countries. Israel's ceremonial president, Yitzhak Herzog, speaking about the October 7th attacks, told an audience, quote, It is an entire nation out there that is responsible. It is not true, this rhetoric about civilians not being aware, not involved. It's absolutely not true. They could have risen up. They could have fought against that evil regime which took over Gaza in a coup d'etat. Unquote. So you hear that, everyone who lives in dictatorships? If you have a bad government, it's your fault for not organizing a coup d'etat. Then the defense minister, Yoav Gallant, tells an interviewer, quote, I have released all restraints. Gaza will never go back to what it was. Unquote. Then an unnamed defense official tells Israeli TV viewers that, quote, Gaza will eventually turn into a city of tents. There will be no buildings, unquote. Yoav Barshesht, an Israeli army colonel and deputy head of the civil administration, says in an interview from Gaza, quote, 
Whoever returns there, if they return hereafter, will find scorched earth, no houses, no agriculture, no nothing. They have no future. Unquote. Netanyahu, meanwhile, reminded Israeli soldiers of the biblical command to, quote, we'll remember what Amalek has done to you, and we will remember, unquote. which is a reference to the ancient tribal arch enemy of the Israelites in the Old Testament, where the prophet Samuel tells King Saul to, quote, utterly destroy all that they have, do not spare them, but kill both man and woman, child and infant, ox and sheep, camel and donkey, unquote. Netanyahu then instructs the Minister of Strategic Planning to have a plan for Gaza after the bombing campaign that, quote, enables a mass escape to European and African countries, unquote. Avi Dichter, Israeli Minister of Agriculture and Security Cabinet member, says, quote, we are now rolling out the Gaza Nahba, referring to the mass crisis of Arab refugees which was created in the 1947 to 1949 war. Israeli newspapers also published memos that the Israeli government had been floating around about how to push all of Gaza's 2.3 million people into the Sinai Desert in Egypt. Since the Israeli response to the Hamas attacks, Israel has rendered two-thirds of Gaza's 2.3 million residents homeless. 80% are displaced, with 60% of the buildings in Gaza destroyed, and most of the north and much of southern Gaza are now uninhabitable due to the destruction plus unexploded ordnance. It's hard to know actual statistics, but all the human rights and news organizations report almost 30,000 dead civilians in Gaza. Meanwhile, during the assault on Gaza, Israeli soldiers gunned down three Israeli hostages who had escaped from Hamas tunnels and who were running around shirtless waving white flags in Gaza. And that shows that they must be doing the same thing to innocent Palestinians on a regular basis, and we just don't hear about it. For example, an American doctor who volunteered to help at a Gaza hospital reports in the LA Times that among the endless tragedies that he witnessed there, quote, on one occasion, a handful of children, all about ages five to eight, were carried to the emergency room by their parents. All had single sniper shots to their head, unquote. On top of all the mass death and destruction from bombing and snipers, it's expected that disease will kill more people than the bombings because so many water treatment plants have been destroyed, as have most hospitals while the hospitals that remain have almost no supplies. Meanwhile, there's a medication-resistant super fungus loose in Gaza, which has already killed an Israeli soldier and who knows how many Palestinians because so many of the hospitals are destroyed, and people are scrambling to survive and to find drinkable water and food. Giora Eland, a former head of Israel National Security and IDF general, who's considered to be on the center or center-right in Israel, in an article wrote, quote, Severe epidemics in the south of the Gaza Strip will bring victory closer, unquote. And this guy no longer has any power, but it shows how the establishment thinks across the very narrow political spectrum in Israel. And on top of disease, there's a famine crisis in Gaza, so that 80% of the people in the world who are currently at the most severe level of famine on the UN famine scale currently live inside of Gaza. Before the October 7th attacks, when the average resident of Gaza was already not properly nourished. An average of 500 trucks of food and goods were entering Gaza each day. Since the war started, you now have about 25 trucks per day on average, and most of them are concentrated on ceasefire days. And it's just been endless horror stories and tragedies every day, as it is in every war, but especially one where you have extreme right-wing fanatics in charge of both sides, and where the side with the extreme, overwhelming military advantage sees all of the civilians on the other side as the enemy, and where the leaders of the weaker side puts their own civilians in danger on purpose in order to maximize PR advantage. In terms of strategy, on one hand, Israel's completely walked into Hamas's trap. Whereas Israel initially had the sympathy of most of the world after the October 7th attacks, the unprecedented scope of the response has turned public opinion against Israel almost everywhere around the world, except in the U.S. In recent years, Israel had taken advantage of the relative media silence about the Palestinians and signed peace agreements and trade agreements with various Arab countries. And they were about to sign a historic one with Saudi Arabia. After Israel's retaliation, these pending deals seem to be off the table, and the existing ones seem to be in jeopardy. Since 2014, the world had more or less forgotten about the situation of the Palestinians. Today, it's constantly in the news and all over social media every day. On the other hand, 
Hamas's October 7th attack can be seen as playing right into the hands of Israel's far right, who've been dreaming for decades for an excuse like this one to expel all of the Palestinians out of West Bank and Gaza, and who seem to be doing what they can to take advantage of this opportunity while it lasts. For example, the Israeli finance minister Bezalel Smotrich said to an Israeli army radio interviewer that regarding Gaza, quote, if we act strategically, they will emigrate and we will live there. We won't let two million stay. With 100,000 or 200,000 in Gaza, the day after debate will be different. They want to leave. They've been living in a ghetto for 75 years. Unquote. Meanwhile, he also told members of his religious Zionism party that, quote, Israel will permanently control the territory of the Gaza Strip. Unquote. Meanwhile, Israel's Minister of National Security, Itmar Ben Gvir, told reporters that the Gaza War is, quote, an opportunity to concentrate on encouraging the migration of the residents of Gaza. Unquote. The Hebrew version of Israel Times, Zman Israel, tells us that the man himself, Netanyahu, is conducting secret negotiations for accepting thousands of immigrants from Gaza to the Congo and other unspecified nations. Intelligence Minister Gila Gamliel told reporters that, quote, voluntary migration is the best and most realistic program for the day after the fighting ends. Unquote. Gamliel also told the conference that, quote, At the end of the war, Hamas rule will collapse. There are no municipal authorities. The civilian population will be entirely dependent on humanitarian aid. There will be no work, and 60% of Gaza's agricultural land will become security buffer zones. The world should support humanitarian emigration because that's the only solution I know. Unquote. The government of South Africa has made an application to the International Court of Justice against Israel for genocide, and you can read the eight pages of genocidal statements by members of the Israeli government and cabinet and military leadership in that application, starting on page 59, many of which I've quoted here. Until recently, I would have said that while what Israel is doing and planning is definitely ethnic cleansing, it doesn't seem to be genocide. Because whatever the technical definition of genocide is, it should, to my mind, involve trying to kill off the majority of a whole people for that word to have any meaning. And I don't like inflation of terms. But when you factor in the famine and disease and how these are predictable and being cited as positive benefits for Israel, I think that the genocide accusation starts to fit the bill more and more. Outside of the level of killing and destruction and starvation, the polls done in the region are some of the saddest things about all of this. A poll in Israel in December 2023 showed that 81% of Jewish Israelis say that Palestinian suffering should be considered very little or not at all in the current Gaza military operation. An earlier poll in November showed that 58% of Jews in Israel thought that Israel was using too little firepower in their attack on Gaza, and only 1.8% thought that they were using too much firepower. Meanwhile, in West Bank and Gaza, another poll from December showed that 72% of the respondents supported the October 7th attack on Israel, and 60% think that violence is the best way of ending the occupation. Interestingly, people on both sides seem to be quite oblivious to the extent of the brutality of the military forces that they support. The overwhelming majority of Palestinian respondents did not know about or denied that Hamas fighters committed atrocities against civilians on October 7th. The thing you'll typically hear is that Hamas fighters are above all religious people and Islam forbids these kind of atrocities so they would never do anything like that. And people believe that stuff. 85% of the respondents said that they didn't see any of the videos showing the violence of that day and 90% said that they did not believe that what was in those videos was true. In Israel, among Jews, you have the exact same phenomenon, where 91.5% of Israeli Jews think that their army is observing the rules of war and international law, and media in Israel barely focus on the extent of destruction and death in Gaza on the civilian population. Interestingly, 81% of Palestinians believe that Hamas's main goal on October 7th was, quote, a response to settler attacks on Al-Aqsa Mosque and on Palestinian citizens, and for the release of prisoners from Israeli prisons, unquote, which is a main priority for the majority of Palestinians. Whereas Israeli Jews see Hamas attacks as basically aimed at killing Jews for the sake of killing Jews and for the broader goal of destroying Israel. <laughs>
Okay, so now, hopefully, you have a basic understanding of the major events of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and some idea of the state of public opinion in the present. And if we want to understand how things got to where they are today, and who's responsible for this situation, and why interpretations of the conflict are so divergent, we need to go back to the beginning of the story from the 1880s until the 1947-48 war. And we need to retell it with a focus on the class dynamics of the Arab and Jewish societies in Palestine and inside of the Zionist movement. And this will open our eyes to a completely different perspective on the conflict, which I think makes much more room for an eventual peace. And it also opens our eyes to start thinking about all intercommunal conflicts differently, especially conflicts involving competing nationalisms. And that's what we'll be doing next time. Hello. If you found this episode useful or enlightening and you have some discretionary income lying around, then by all means, please give some of it to me. <laughs> and also please consider giving money to some humanitarian relief for Gaza as well. Not much relief is getting into Gaza now, but Doctors Without Borders has been trying to get medical supplies in, and the Palestinian Children's Relief Fund is an important humanitarian organization that's also trying to carry out its work where it can. And for me and my needs for money, uh, it usually takes me several months full-time to make these episodes with the research, writing, and then video editing. And for some reason lately, every episode just gets more and more complicated and labor-intensive and time-consuming. And during all that time, I'm either working at the same time because I need to earn money, but like just enough to survive, or else I'm not working and also not making any money, and then I have to make it up afterwards. And all this causes a giant hit to my income. Like I mentioned in the video and in previous videos, I'm a lawyer for tenants. And because I basically work full-time on this podcast, my annual income from lawyering is almost exactly what a full-time minimum wage worker makes in Canada. And this year, it's actually going to be a little bit less than that. Though thankfully, I'm starting to make some money from the podcast as well. Now, I became a lawyer exactly so that I could work part-time and I could afford to support working on projects like this. But holy crap, this is a lot of work and I can't keep doing it at this pace without some income. Most of my podcast income comes from Patreon supporters who pay per episode, so I can go a long time without getting paid, even though I might be working on this the whole time, though more and more people are sending me one-time donations and subscribing for monthly donations on PayPal and Ko-fi, which I greatly appreciate. And please note that I don't monetize my channel, even though I'm eligible for it, because I don't want to gunk up your life with more stupid advertisements than you're already subjected to. And I'm not ever going to do any paywalled content, because that defeats the whole purpose of doing a show geared at spreading knowledge and skills. Like, I'll soon be doing some bonus commentary episodes, but they will still be available to everyone. So your subscriptions are not purchasing a commodity, they are solidarity payments, because you're someone who can afford it, and you want the show to keep going, and you want me to keep going. If you don't have money to spare, do not feel bad. There are a ton of things that I can't support because I can't afford it, and I still appreciate that you get something out of this. There are options in the show notes to do per-episode donations, or one-time donations, or monthly donations, if you don't mind the fact that it sometimes takes me three to four months to put an episode. Episodes that I have in the works are the Class Conflict Analysis of the Israeli-Palestinian Conflict, one called How Socialism Would Solve All of Jordan Peterson's Problems, and another episode on Why the Purpose of Identity Politics is Genocide, and that's about how humans evolve the tendency for negative outgroup and positive in-group discrimination, and what that means for politics and how to deal with that in organizing and in messaging, and an episode on Why the Russian Revolution Failed, which I started before, and this is going to be the continuation where we actually get to the Russian Revolution itself, and we look at what the founders of the Soviet Union were thinking and saying and doing when they set up that state, and what went wrong with it, and how there might have been successful communist revolutions all over Europe after World War I if the founders of the Soviet Union had done things differently. I'm also very soon going to be doing Chapter 4 of The Dawn of Everything, and that should be interesting to you whether you know what that book is or not. And we're going to be looking at egalitarian societies, especially hunter-gatherer societies, why they exist and how they exist how they manage to stay egalitarian, and what we can learn from that to apply to our own industrial civilizations. 
And I'm also going to finish up that episode about what happens when you inject class analysis into Kimberly Crenshaw's famous article where she introduces intersectionality, and it is actually quite shocking. As always, there's a bibliography and a transcript linked in the show notes. And if you're watching this on YouTube, you can hear the audio podcast version on your podcast app. And if you're listening on a podcast, check out the YouTubes because there's lots of fun pictures and memes and videos of my punim. And if you like the music on the podcast, I make all the music. So check out my stuff that you can download for free at star69, all one word, dot bandcamp.com. And you can also send me money there too if you want. And please like and subscribe and also review the show on Apple Music helps the show pop up more readily on searches. And contact me with any corrections or suggestions on the YouTube comments, or if necessary, at worldwidescroats at gmail.com. And until next time, see ya!